being broke There's no way out of such a joke Can't get out of the red on the bread line Gonna dive in deep, it's the perfect crime Like a beggar, like a thief To get a brace like pulling teeth Try to make it, but that bag and me to borrow Spend, 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 look, there's no tomorrow Acting like you're loaded Knowing that you're broke When you got a lot of nothing Begin the year with 50 fighters. Tonight we are down to the final eight. By the end of the night, one will be crowned the King of Kings as the K1 World Grand Prix Champion. Hello everybody, I'm Michael Chavello. Welcome to the 18th annual K1 World Grand Prix. The Super Bowl of striking, the granddaddy of them all. There is nothing that matches the excitement and the atmosphere of the K1 World Grand Prix. Joining me as always, my verbal sparring partner, Mike Kogan. Mikey, great to be back here with you again. My third time commentating the Grand Prix with you. My ninth time here at the K1 Live. It is always an epic night. Absolutely. You know, every year we tell the fans, hey, this is the best K-1 World Grand Prix final, and each year it just gets better and better. This one, a lot of buzz around it, a lot of speculations, fans talking on message boards left and right. This guy's going to do that. This guy's going to do this. Of course, the top story, the top speculation, can Alistair Overeem, in his only second year in K-1, go all the way to the final and possibly even win the K-1 World Grand Prix? Well, guess what? We're going to answer those questions tonight. And we are joined by a very special guest, mixed martial arts star, King Mo Luo. King, great to have you here ringside. Your first ever K1 World Grand Prix. And brother, you have been like a kid in a candy shop here in Tokyo this week. You are loving K1. I'm loving K1. I feel like I'm five years old again at a candy shop. Seriously. You know, um, I'm full of questions, and hopefully tonight they'll be answered. Folks, let's take you through the fight card here tonight because this tournament, as Mike said, is absolutely stacked. It is a very hard one to call as we take a look at these brackets. Quarterfinal number one from the USA, Mighty Mo Saliga takes on the triple K1 world champion, Peter Ertz. Quarterfinal number two, defending and four-time champion, Semi Schultz looks to write his name into the history books and become the sport's first ever five-time champion. He takes on the K1 heavyweight champion, Kiltaro. Quarterfinal number three, son, B of the draw, the Turkish leg singer, Gokhan Saki, takes on the first ever Romanian to feature in the K1 World Grand Prix, Daniel Gita. And rounding up the quarterfinal stage, this one will be epic. The Ream, Alastair Overeem, takes on a man who has won world titles from super middleweight to heavyweight. And this is the title he most wants to win, however, Tyrone Spong. Mike, taking a close look at these matchups here tonight, obviously Semi Short comes in as a favourite, both of the fans and the bookmakers. BetOnFighting.com has him at minus 135, the overall favourite. Alistair Overeem at plus 205, but Semi is the man to beat, and you'd be wrong to list anyone else as a favourite. Most definitely. I mean, Semi Shield has the formula for tournaments and how to win them. Uh, you know, he's able to use his athleticism, his gigantic size advantage over just about everybody in this competition, and his phenomenal skills for that size. And he's, he's got the formula. He sits behind the jab, the front kick, and if you somehow get past those, there comes the devastating knees, and he's like a machine. Semi Schultz, who won the K1 Grand Prix last year in a world record time, five minutes and 52 seconds, eclipsing Peter Ertz's 1998 former record of six minutes and 43. Alistair Overham, King Mo, is the man that most fans believe can beat Semi Schultz, but to get there, he's going to get past two opponents in Spong and then either Saki or Giza. You've seen the ring this week, and as always, he is looking just a picture of awesomeness. Yeah, man, Overham looks ready. Man, he looks strong, but he has his hands full with Spong and the winner of Gita and Saki. You know, he, that's a tough, tall order for him to, you know, take care of. And uh, we'll see if he can do that tonight. 
Mike, speaking of Tyrone Spong, we see Spong the heaviest he's ever been here tonight. He comes in at 105 kilos, training with Rene Ruse and, uh, and Ernesto Hoost, of course. Spong saying that he has not trained to win the entire tournament. He has trained specifically to beat the ream here tonight. And word is, when these two men used to train under Lucian Carbine back in the day when Spong weighed 75 kilos and Alistair weighed 95 kilos, Spong would school Alistair in sparring. Of course, completely different time of you know their careers now but I wonder if psychologically Tyrone can still find the tricks that he used to beat Alistair back in those days in sparring well here's what here's what's going on with Tyrone Spong he felt in a way insulted that Alistair picked him at the uh, at the draw because he said you know Alistair said we used to be sparring partners guess he forgot those sparring sessions so he's on a mission and uh, you know we talked about it earlier today uh, we've been talking about it all throughout I said listen I'm not gonna pick any winners today you know we're just gonna let the dice roll and call it as we see it uh, Tyrone Spong is going to be the only fight that I will pick, and I will pick Tyrone as a winner for this fight. The United States representative, Mighty Mo Saliga, has slimmed down, if you can call it slimming down. He's 275 pounds here, Mighty Mo. Mike, interestingly, though, there's always the question of just how diligently Mo prepares for these tournaments. I hear varied reports that he hasn't been training as hard as he should have. And indeed, he turned up in Tokyo two nights ago on his own. He did not have a corner with him. He has enlisted Five for Lemoy from Team Ichigeki, former Golden Gloves champion, to be in his corner here tonight. But what does this tell us about Mo's chances and his possible preparation? Well, here's the thing. I spoke to Mo, and he is as motivated as ever. You can't take that away from him. And he's a lot slimmed down. I mean, 270 for Mo is slim. This guy walks around 340, 350 pounds. I, you know, is that going to give him an edge with the cardio, which is something that's been questionable? We're about to see. At the final 16, he promised to come back with a six-pack. Well, he almost made it. This is about as six-packy as, as Mo is going to get. So I'm looking forward to this. I think, you know, I think he's he might pull off an upset here. Mo is considered the complete outsider, plus 2,200 to win the tournament here tonight. A thrilling matchup we have in the quarterfinals. King Mo is the one we're all looking forward to. Gokan Saki versus Daniel Gita. Now, Saki is firmed as a real dark horse amongst most fans. He comes in at plus 750. Still, the bookmakers, though, have Gita as the preferred fighter at plus 500. But Gita has been carrying an injury as of two weeks ago. Now, as much as we have tried to probe and find out what the injury is, we still don't know. I believe it may have been his groin. There was word that he was limping about five days ago, but Gita says he is fully healed and it's nothing to worry about. How do you gauge the mood of both Daniel Gita and Gokan Saki? Well, Gita kind of seems uh, standoffish a little bit. I think I think he might be sick, honestly. You know, he you know, a lot of guys come in the injuries, but interestingly, Mo, on that point, you were sitting behind him in the bus ride here, and you said that he was sweating quite a bit, and the bus really wasn't that hot. Yeah, I saw him sweating, wiping his forehead. Uh, his head was against the um, window, and uh, it was fog, um, conden condensation buildup. But, you know, he has his hands full with Goku Saki, who looks like he's out here at a club, partying, smiling. You know, you know, he feels free, you know, just letting loose. He he's ready. Go exactly. That's the term to use, let loose, because Gokan Saki, Mike, looks like a rabid dog ready to be let off that Go leash and just ready to, as I said last time, faster Saki, kill, kill. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Gokan Saki finds this fun, but don't be, don't, uh, don't take it as the wrong way. The fun for him is business, 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 and he's come here to win. He wants to see Reem in the, in the quarterfinals. He's got a beef. Everybody seems to be have a beef to pick with Reem. Uh, you know, he wants to go all the way. He's not, he's going, hey, you guys count me out. Watch me in the finals. We'll see. Another man to keep an eye on. He comes in at plus 600 as the Triple K1 World Champion Peter Ertz. He last won the title back in 1998 in record time. He has competed in every K1 Grand Prix except for last year. This is his 17th time competing in the GP. And at 40 years old, you are still going to see him tonight ripped, stripped and striated. Peter Ertz is still King Mo, a force to be reckoned with. And for the first time since about 1997, reunited with the man who led him to consecutive K1 Grand Prix crowns in 94 and 95, Chukarinki Jim's Tom Harris. Yeah, man, Peter Arts, uh, I think that uh, this, is, this is his year, you know what I'm saying, to try to attempt to do something. He looks fresh, he looks smiling. He's the most smiley faced person I've seen since I've been out here. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this, just the tournament. I'm, I'm ready to see it get on. <laughs> The other man we 
need to talk about here is the K1 World Heavyweight Champion, Kyotaro. So unheralded, so underrated, but time and time again, Mike, Kyotaro has proven himself a big occasion fighter. A lot of people don't give him credit, but he's got one of the best counter right hands in the game. He's exceptionally fast, exceptionally smart, and he's beaten Melvin Manoff. He's beaten Gokan Saki, Jerome Labana. He's knocked out Peter Ertz. Kyotaro could prove a major headache for Semi Schultz even though he gives up over 30 kilos in weight and Schultz almost a foot taller than him. Most definitely. I mean, Kyotaro is actually, uh, and we've watched him and we've commentated him from, from the get, uh, he has improved tremendously. What he's improved is his timing in what he does. He does the same thing over and over again, but his timing is much better. And Kyo Sammy Shield might find himself chasing Kyotaro around this ring while Kyotaro is, you know, I would say, have to go after his body hard and then keep circling. He might end up winning a decision. Okay, so once again, you see the eight fighters for the 18th annual K1 World Grand Prix, the Super Bowl of striking. Who do you like, folks? Wherever you're watching our broadcast around the world, King Mo, if you had to put your money on someone, who would it be? And I know that's a tough question to ask because this field this year is just so hard to choose. Oh, man, that's the question I've been, you know, it's been in my head since I first got to Japan. You know, I know Semi probably makes the finals, but the other side of the bracket has so many well, you know, they're tough guys there. I don't know who's going to make it through, but I'm thinking the semifinals will be Spong versus uh, Saki, and the winner of that will make it to fight Simi Shelt. Okay, so interestingly then, I've got two guys sitting next to me who both think Tyrone Spong is going to beat Alistair over him. I was first. Mike, you were first. You said it a few days ago. But, Mo, I'm interested to hear why do you think Spong's the one to take out the ream in the quarterfinals? Well, I, I just think, you know, talking to him and seeing his demeanor, you know, uh, he seems like, you know, he has a chip on his shoulder, ready to prove something. Uh, he's athletic, probably far more technical. And I just think that, you know, he has a mental edge over, over him because they used to train together. Mike, your thoughts are similar, obviously. Yes, right along those lines. And I think one of the other things is experience. You know, a lot of people, there's so much hype around Alistair, and, and there should be. I have nothing against Alistair. You know, I finally got on his good side. I definitely don't want to get on his bad side. But that being said, Tyrone Swong has been fighting in kickboxing matches way, way longer than Alistair even knew what kickboxing was. And I think that experience gives him the edge because he's able to de devise the right uh, uh, strategy and execute it. That's what experience is for, and Tyrone has that, and I believe that's what's going to give him the edge. Let's go one back, guys, to the uh, what we are tipping will be the fight of the night here tonight between Saki and Gita. And uh, Mo, Saki to get through for you on that one? I think Saki will pull it off. You know, um, just uh, Gita, Gita is tough, you know, big, and has ferocious leg kicks, but I think the fact that he's sick or something's wrong with him, you know, it's leaked out that something's wrong with him. I think the fact that, you know, he has a little injury or illness, that um, they'll catch up to him in this fight. Mike, Daniel Gita, we've spoken to him over the last couple of days. I did see him at breakfast this morning. I said to him, Daniel, the injury, are you okay? And what he did was he dropped his hands down around his groin region and waved around there, and he said, I'm all okay, which to me indicated that maybe he was carrying a groin injury. At least we know it's something to do with the lower half of the body because he was limping a few days ago. But, again, we're not quite sure what it was, Mike. And, and, and Mo's saying that uh, Gita was sweating up a storm on the bus coming over. You wonder if he's caught a fever because a cold and flu is going around Tokyo at the moment. I don't know of any growing fever. Maybe he was just telling you, you know, I got big cojones and don't worry about any of it. We don't really know. You know, maybe he's a sweater. I don't know, you know, him on a personal level. All I know is that Daniel Gita is a very game fighter. He's a very strategic fighter. He knows how to use his attributes to be able to impose his game and win. And it's going to be an exciting fight. And, I, you know, I've said from the very beginning, I'm not picking any winners or losers in here. Every one of these guys has the abilities to beat the other. There's a game plan that each one of them can execute to beat the other. And I'm just going to stay with that. The only fight I picked was Tyrone Spong over him. And that's it. That's all I got to say. Folks, let me take you through the betting lines for the 18th World Grand Prix. Semi Schultz, the favorite, at minus 135. Then Alistair over him at plus 205. Daniel Geyser at plus 500. Peter Ertz at plus 600. Gokan Saki at plus 750. Then we move into the thousands. We've got Tyrone Spong at 1,200. Kyotaro at 1,200, and Mighty Mo at plus 2,200.
2,200. Is that fair on Mighty Mo? Do you think, Mike, that betting line plus 2,200 on the sole American competitor who is known for his one-punch knockout power? Yes, it is, because the problem is that, uh, you know, bookmakers know it, the fans know it. it. The questioning is not in his heart or his skills or his abilities to win. It's in his dedication. Is he focused to win this tournament? Is he focused to put up a fight? You know, we're not questioning anything beyond that, and I think it's a fair out because lately he's shown that he's not. Semi Schult, the favourite at minus 135, and King Mo Lawal, I know you're a fan of K1 over the years, so you've seen Semi Schult's four Grand Prix victories in the past. What do you think would be the key to trying to stop Semi Schult here tonight? Well, you can't let Semi Schult find his range. He has the, the long arms, the go go gadget jab, knees, kicks. He has it all. You have to confuse him, either swarm him or use your athleticism to create angles and uh, attack. That's the key to beat him. Semi Schult has never entered an eight man tournament that he has lost. He has won them all, whether that be a K1 regional tournament or four K1 World Grand Prix. And as I said earlier, he did it in record time, 5 minutes 52 in 2009. The thing about Semi Mike that is so impressive is A, he's 6 foot 11, he fights as a tall fighter, he does not shrink himself. B, his cardio is superb, and C, his work rate is like that of a middleweight fighter. It is amazing. He never tires. Most, and that's what, uh, you know, a lot of the fighters have challenged with, but if you see, uh, you know, the ones that have had success with him, like Butter, and even Hesty in his last fight, a little later on in rounds, is, is the storming overwhelming him. You have to come after him. You cannot let him establish his rhythm. Once you do, it's over. Okay, folks, we are about to get underway shortly here at the Ariaki Coliseum as the crowd continues to build in here. We are right by the water in Tokyo Bay, and we are going to have a sellout on our hands here tonight. Once again, Simi Schultz is the man to beat Alistair Overeem, the second favourite with both the bookmakers and the fans, but the man who has really risen as a genuine dark horse in this tournament over the last couple of days is Gokan Saki. It was also Daniel Gita until word spilled out about that injury. In a few hours' time, we will know who will be crowned the K1 King of Kings, who will be crowned as the finest heavyweight striker on the planet. As I said, only seven different men have ever won the title. Will Schultz or Ertz get another title to add to their mantle here tonight, or will we see a new champion emerge? Obviously, once again, King, you've got to go semi short as the favorite, but you're also thinking Tyrone Spong could go all the way. Tyrone Spong or Gokan Saki. Whoever comes out the fresh, freshest. Mike, you're on the bandwagon as well for Tyrone Spong. I would have to pick Semi as going to the finals, and I'll pick Tyrone as the winner of the Reem fight, and that's as far as I'm going to go. It is going to be awesome, folks. Wherever you're watching our broadcast around the world, the 18th annual K1 World Grand Prix will be a happening in a few moments time let's take another look here at peter Ertz, the triple k1 world champion been a long time between drinks mike for Ertz. last won the title in 1998 tom harrant back in his corner though Branko sikatik in his corner the first ever k1 champion back in 93 it's going to be a huge inspiration for peter well let me put let me put a thought in everybody's mind here just just to play devil's advocate let's assume that peter arch beats mighty mo which i believe may happen uh uh, uh very decisively he moves into the quarterfinal, we're assuming against uh, Semi Shield. He has beaten Semi Shield. He has the formula to beat Semi Shield. What if we see Peter Arts in the finals? You've that is wonder. not beyond the realm it of is possibility. It's not beyond the realm of possibility, but King Mo, you've got to then ask the question at 40 years old, as buffed as he is, does Peter Arts still have the gas tank to run such a heavy gauntlet of three fights in one night? Well, if he fights efficiently and fights smart and keeps all the fights in his strength, it can be done. Bernard Hopkins has done it. Randy Couture has done it. So it can be done. Mo, again, this being your first time ever at the K1 World Grand Prix, and you've met most of the fighters now. Do any of them surprise you standing next to them? Do you think to yourself, wow, that guy is bigger than I actually thought he would be? Every single one of them. <laughs> Even Gokan Saki, all those guys are big. You know, uh, it's unbelievable how big these guys are. On TV, they look a little smaller, but, you know, uh, Semi Shell is a giant. He should be playing basketball somewhere. You know, all these guys are, are <laughs> humongous. Who's the most imposing one to stand next to, have you found? Probably uh, 
Super Brother Overeem. <laughs> <laughs> Alistair Overeem. Mike, I want to go back to that again. Uh, the Overeem versus Spong encounter. Overeem comes in as a favourite for that one for bookmakers. Minus 465. Spong at plus 365. Why do you think, though, and you'd be in the minority of thinking, why would Spong beat the Reem here tonight? Because there is a formula to beating over him. Badahari showed it. Uh, Remy showed it. Maybe not as decisively as Badahari, but he has. And Tyrone Spong, in talking to him uh, privately, has said, you know, we, we talked. And I said, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And that's what he's planning on doing. So, Folks, the lights go down at the Ariake Coliseum. It's time for the K1 World Grand Prix. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Ariake Coliseum here in Tokyo, Japan, as FEG proudly presents the Fields K-1 World Grand Prix 2010 Final. Tonight, the eight best fighters in the world will be competing in this great tournament to determine who will be the Fields K-1 World Grand Prix 2010 champion. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get it started! I'm very happy with Baba, but I never I thought I would be like this when I was young. But when I could do it over again, I would do the same. I remember when I was eight, I watched WWF, Hulk Hogan, and I loved it. That's funny that I, later on in life, I'm a real fan, because WWF is fake. You may. I'm very happy, I'm very happy that I have Alistair in my first fight. And uh, then I can show everybody what I'm about. And I'm prettier. I look better than him. <laughs> so if you want to imagine something was not possible, you make it possible, that's your goal. But now you cannot deny that it's the fifth time and it's, uh, it's very special, but uh, it has nothing to do with fighting. それぞれの人生、それぞれの夢を乗せて、ここにあるのは世界最強で最高の舞台。生き残った8人の男たち、ここから始まる世界で最も過酷な戦い。We will be gedreven uit uh, die haat wat je moet hebben, dat je gewoon ja, wil winnen. Dat zit. Ik ben zelf zo, maar 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 ik ben zelf zo, I will sac sacrifice my life for uh, to be in the K1 and uh, now for the f in the final. And uh, I do everything for uh, be somewhere where I want. Strength, comfort, loyalty. I mean, those are, that's what it means to me. Uh, my dreams are just uh, being a world champion and being successful at what I do for me and my family. Kazoku society, pai ga aru, hana ga aru, koufun ga aru, tsiyo sa ga aru, so shite, kibo ga aru. Sekai sai kyo to yu shogou ni jinsei o kakeru, tsua mono domo no atsuki ikizama. Now is the year, maybe next year, and then it will be finished. So now is my opportunity to retire. I can be older, and the level goes higher, you know. So this is one of my last opportunities. If 
I win the K1 championships, in my opinion, I am the strongest. Because you are the strongest in K1 and you're the strongest in MMA. So you hold two championship titles, two belts, then you're the strongest. What does this mean? That's the K1 dream of Alice to become the champion, but that's also a dream. Uh, I am the champion and uh, if they want to put him in front, they have to do that. You know? That's not my concern. They can make me as small as they want, but I'm still the biggest. I want to have the crown in the end and the belt, and then uh, we see who's left. Show my best spirit. For me, the winning is not the most important, but rugby we must have a heavy fight. You know? Cut is very important, but the Japanese man who is the world's best striker has to be able to take the fight to the end. Two hundred and sixty-five pounds 
of hulking humanity that is the Reem Alistair Overeem. ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイトーツ。ケイト
2008年ワールドグランプリ初出場でいきなり世界3位ボンクラッシャーのニックネーム通りその激しすぎる攻撃で破壊されたファイター数多し KO 決着こそが生きがいのエロ自慢そして今回相手は絶対的な自信を持つ極真ファイター今年のつまずきは今年で終わり k 1次世代のリーダーになるべく圧倒的な返り討ちを誓う k 1制覇の望みがある限り負けられない訳があるだから激しく打ち合う負けられない訳があるだから強くなるエベルトン・テイシーラ VS エロール・ジマーマTashira, who told me 
that he may go back to defend the World Open Kyokushin Karate Tournament crown in 2011. Would love to get a win here tonight and maybe try and finagle his way into the tournament. Speaking of the tournament, some shout outs, some tips and predictions from our fans. Charles Alwa from Minneapolis. He says it'll be Semi Schultz in the final against Alistair Overeem. And Dado Durovich from Tampa, Florida thinks Kyotaro beats Alistair Overeem in the final. Let's go to the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a reserve fight scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting out of the blue corner, he stands 190 centimeters tall and weighed in at 112 kilograms. Here is the K1 World Grand Prix 2008 European Tournament Champion from Curaçao. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Errol Zimmerman. And across the ring, his opponent fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 190 centimeters tall and weighed in at 108.5 kilograms. Here is the K1 World Grand Prix 2008 Japan Tournament Champion from Brazil. Here is Everton Teixeira. A rematch that Teixeira has been asking for is finally a reality. Zimmerman and Teixeira, Holland versus Brazil. We are set for three by three minute rounds, one extra round in case of a draw. The winner receives official reserve fighter status for the eight man fields K1 World Grand Prix. Teixeira at 6 3, also Zimmerman 6 3. Slight weight advantage to Teixeira, 243 pounds, Zimmerman at 237. Yeah! The voice, Michael Chevello, Mike Kogan, and King Mo Lawal with your inside. Teixeira, the favorite at minus 145, Zimmerman at plus 115. Look out for the counter right hand here on Teixeira. And look out for the bombing left hooks and overhand rights of Errol Zimmerman. Zimmerman, who looks like he's carrying a little extra weight around the midsection. As I said, he's been training for the last two weeks in Pattaya, Thailand, at the Golden Glory gym over there in preparation. Teixeira being training at Ichigeki Plaza in Ibisu here in Tokyo. Good jab too there from Errol. And there's the counter right hand from Teixeira early on. Snakes the jab through and Errol goes to the lead thigh. This is a solid start from these two men, Mike. I'm liking the leg kicks from Teixeira. You know, we've said it many times that he's kind of abandoned his Kyokushin background, but he's come out here with some good leg kicks. Errol looks very, very intense, though. I mean, he, he really knows that he's got to make a statement here um, in this reserve fight. Teixeira throws the right hand down the tube. There's the overhand right, and now Zimmerman pressed into the corner. He's got to get off the ropes here to Zimmerman, and this is a violent Teixeira. This is a brutal Teixeira. Oh, he snakes that jab, smack back to the kisser again, does the Brazilian. An aggressive start here from Everton Teixeira. A very Tracks strong. that round kick off the lead leg into the liver section. Nice for Washigeri. And again from Teixeira. And he sticks the jab. He could not relent here, Teixeira. And he is all over Zimmerman. In the opening minute and 40 seconds, Mike. A very impressive start from Teixeira. And I mean, the, the most impressive part is his, his uh, attitude and his anger and his willingness to really hurt his opponents. You know, we've kind of said that over his career, he's become a little dull. And here you can feel the intensity. Left hook there from Teixeira. He is setting that jackhammer of a right hand. Coming off the fight of his career against Peter Ertz in the final 16 in Seoul, where he went toe to toe with the Dutch Lumberjack, losing by decision after an extension round. He's landing that counter right hook repeatedly on Errol. And Zimmerman so far doesn't have a lot of headaches to pose for Teixeira. Look at the evasion there. Teixeira gets on the inside of the right hand from Errol. And good footwork we are seeing from Teixeira. Quite often the Kyokushin style fighters can be very flat footed. As that's the way they fight in Kyokushin karate. But you see the boxing footwork here on Teixeira. Now Zimmerman comes forward, power solos of his own. And Teixeira stands his ground and throws down. There's the right hand of the tube from Teixeira. He's had more rights than Amnesty International here in the first mark. 
fantastic performance from Teixeira, but hey, you gotta give Zimmerman props. He had some pretty good counter punches and some counter knees there that landed nicely. End of the first round, we go to the towels, and King Mo Lawal, you're gonna give that one to the impressive Evident Teixeira. Yeah, Eric, look, he looked strong, came out very aggressive. I just don't like the fact that uh, Zimmerman, he looks kind of more timid, timid. I think it's the, the right hands that's, that's doing that to him, make it more timid to, to, to mix it up until towards the end of the round. Fight for Lemoyne, Jason Vermoa, Babu de Silva in the corner there. Oh, they're the Tintichero. We've got a 10-9 for the Brazilian after one. This for the official reserve of status for the Fields K1 at World Grand Prix. And indeed, all three judges do give it to Evident Teixeira, 10-9 on their scorecards. Some more of those fan tips for the tournament here tonight. Cabaraul from Romania has over him as the winner. Over Semi Schultz in the final. Spencer Redmond from San Jacinto, oh, no. California, has over him beating Semi Schult via TKO. Here we go, second round. Let's see if Tashira will continue to tee off with that right hand as Errol tries to kick the catch the round kick off the back leg. You can see the midsection there of Errol. He is carrying more weight than we have ever seen, looking very bloated indeed, and starting to blow a little heavy here in the second, which does concern me, Mike, as for the conditioning of Errol. Errol's conditioning has been a question. His dedication has been a question. He said, hey, listen, I need to prove myself here in this fight. And so far, I don't think he's too far behind, but he does need to step it up. I, I want to see him use more leg kicks, uh, both inside and outside thigh kicks, and try to get Teixeira into exchange. When they have the exchange, Teixeira tends to swing wild. If Zimmerman comes straight, straight down the pipe, I think he can land it and knock uh, Teixeira out. Teixeira looking for that counter right hand as he brings the forearms to guard against the round kick from Zimmerman. Teixeira on the front foot now. He's got Zimmerman backed into a corner, curls the overhand right, turns the knuckles in nicely, then goes to the carcass. Zimmerman did not expect to share it, to come out this valiantly and stand and trade with him. It is a complete difference from the last time they fought. Here tonight, Teixeira is the aggressor. Teixeira is showing Zimmerman no respect, and I don't think Zimmerman expected it at all, Mikey. And uh, he does look a little baffled. I mean, he looks a little confused. He seems to try to get something going, and he can't. And uh, Teixeira's counter right is just landing repeatedly over and over and over. Did you see that beautiful high check there from Teixeira? That was just succulent. He circles off counterclockwise. Good outside Viking, just above the left knee, and then goes to the lower right rib cage of Zimmerman. One minute 10 remaining here in the second round. Another impressive round so far, Your Highness, for Everton Teixeira. Yeah, Everton, the thing about Everton, what he's doing correctly is he's going out first. He's firing first and he's firing last. Uh, Zimmerman's looking to counter way too much, and he's taking, um, taking a beating. Left hook from Zimmerman. Nice uppercut off the lead hand from Everton. Look at the way that Everton Teixeira is constantly moving here. He is never a stagnant target for Errol to unleash those thunderous hands of his. It's the best footwork we have seen so far in the K1 career of Everton Teixeira. Yeah, Everton is blowing heavy here. I, I have to say his stamina is definitely being challenged here. And, uh, and you're right, I mean, it's it's Everton's movement and his ring management that's really winning him this fight because he's always he's always evasive, he's always under angles, and he's attacking from everywhere. And he's firing first, firing first and firing last. He's you know like, right, right, for instance right there, punching first, punching last. He lands last, and he sets the table. Teixeira circling again counterclockwise, goes to the body. Oh. Zimmerman tries to land a couple of power salvos. To no avail, though, for the bone crusher. And as he walks back to his corner with some swelling under his right eye, he does shake his head to his corner man, Cor Hemmers, and the legendary Ramon Decker also in the corner here. Mike Hernandez from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, sees Simi Schult defeating Tyrone Spong in the final tonight. Max Murillo from Hawthorne, California, has Overeem defeating Schultz. And Scott Donette from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, has Schultz winning against Overeem in the final. All three judges, 10-9 yet again to Evident Teixeira. He has 2018 after two, which means that Zimmerman now has to knock out Teixeira to win this fight. And what has been a highly impressive performance 
from the Brazilian. Third and final round. Good left hand there from Errol. Harper can almost took out the ring lights and he chomps the lead leg. Has Zimmerman found his second wind? And you've got to ask the question, would he now leave the run too late? Because it will take something monumental to stop this incarnation of Everton Teixeira, Mike. He would need a knockdown at least to try to make it a 10-8 round and maybe take it into extension round. But at least in early on, the so far the 30 seconds of the fight, I'm seeing from from uh, Zimmerman is what I was trying, to, what I wanted to see. Some leg kicks, some aggression, and be the first one. But unfortunately, he's starting to kind of go back to his old ways, so to speak. There is always a problem when fighters rely only on their power and neglect their conditioning. And I think that's what's happened to Errol here tonight. He is not in the best shape we have seen him. And he is purely relying on his one-punch knockout power. But against an opponent who was always mobile, like Teixeira, and countering him beautifully, that game plan is not working for Errol. He finds a little flurry bit. All he does is rattle the dreadlocks here of Teixeira and not a whole lot more. Teixeira drifts back to centre ring, always getting his back off the ropes is Everton Teixeira. And this is how Zimmerman should have been fighting a lot sooner. He's fighting with more urgency, but, you know, now he's being far more aggressive, but it might be too little too late. Fakes the inside leg kick to Teixeira. Three punch combination, nothing getting through the double forearms go from Errol and that lactic acid is building up, he's slowing down, he's blowing heavy now, Errol's in there. Oh, there's the Brazilian kick, otherwise known correctly as a question mark kick, as any bundle of sticks would know. Just a slip over in the neutral corner there for Errol Zimmerman, Shihan Isobi, one of the head honchos of Kyokushin is here inside. Teixeira in the corner, you'll see him circle off to his left and get back to centre ring. There he goes. Nicely done from Everton. He is forcing Zimmerman to come forward to him. Zimmerman is throwing these punches at full extension that are very slow and allowing Everton to easily block them and then counter. Nice kick to the liver section. Everton completely unfazed here, Mike. A lot of it is his movement. Uh, Zimmerman can't seem to find a way to cut off the ring and really try to trap uh, Everton in one of the corners. So he just ends up stalking him throughout the ring, but it's really Everton that's doing all the damage. The final 10 seconds of this fight. Will there be a Hail Mary shot for Earl Zimmerman? I don't think so. Everton Teixeira will become oh, the official reserve fighter for the K1 World Grand Prix. Speaking of which, Dylan Brown from Bowden, Alberta, Canada, thinks Peter Ertz defeats Alistair Overeem in the final. Alex Snyder from Hollywood, California, thinks Schilt beats Overeem. And Philip Walschlager from Mönchengladbach, Germany, says Semi Schilt over Alistair Overeem by TKO. Now, many fans who have written to us during the week giving their predictions. Nick Benton from Charlotte, North Carolina, has Alistair Overeem beating Semi Schultz in the final. Corey Slade from Dead Valley, California, has Semi over Alistair in the final. And Paramvia Sherry from Toronto in Canada has Overeem over Schultz. It is a unanimous decision here. Everton to Shira. And Shihan Isobe looking on. Becomes the official reserve fighter for the K1 World Grand Prix. A Grand Prix which John Price from Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada says Schultz will beat over him in the final. Mike Davis from Edson, Alberta, Canada thinks Daniel Keita will beat Schultz in the final. And Derek Valdez from Las Vegas sends Gita over Schultz also in the final. Jason Vermoa, Maurizio De Silva with their charge evident to Shira. A little bit of swelling on that left orbital there of to Shira, but nothing to phase the dreadlocked one. Please exit the ring. Thank you. A 
Fantastic start to what will be a night of awesomeness here at the Ariake Coliseum in Tokyo. And coming up next quarter, final number one, Mighty Mo takes on Peter Ertz. Sando Seista. K1 17 Kan Kenin Shitsugeta. Sono Legendo Gakadaru. Ozae no Saigo no Chance. I cannot train two, three times a day. I train one time a day, sometimes two. I cannot do a long time press. Must be explosive and short. Legendo no Kakuto Jinse o Monogatari. Manshin Soi no Karada. But the inside is not too good. It is, uh, the bones here are not too good. They're broken and all kind of things. The surgeon said to me, better do nothing on it anymore. Tape is good. Because they cannot do nothing on about it anymore. But they help me a lot too, you know. All the people who just have Legend ga kachi kuwaeru. Aratana densetsu no ichi page. I'm the chef in the house. Um, I like cooking. As you guys all know, I love to eat. <laughs> Cause I cook some of the best chicken soup. Mighty Mo, America. So you you got to probably provide for a good like ten people or more. We don't do the count. One, two, three, four. Uh, I don't do the count. Yeah. You know, I don't. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's just big everybody. Yeah. Um, you hungry, you hungry, you hungry. Eat. <laughs> Someone start. Someone start. Daikoku Bashira ga daikazuku o sasaeru wake. Strength, comfort, loyalty. I mean, those are, that's what it means to me. Uh, my dreams are. Just uh, being a world champion and being successful at what I do for me and my family. Revenge, uh, revenge is a part of it, but I think, you know, I owe a big favor on that. Yeah. Mr. You cannot uh, be champion if you do nothing, you know? I'm always training, always busy, always see it, you know. I want them to be part of me. Yeah, sure, but I want to show I'm one of the best. Uh, get the best uh, last years out of my career. I want to show the best. Is that my final year, so I want to make the best of it the last year. When I'm 50, I will stop. Ano toki no kakayaki wo toribodo su tameni. Uh, I'm going to show my best spirit and try to knock everybody out. And make many good fights, but this time I show a real legend. Who's. My team versus Peter Arts. So many, you know, for so many years, he's fought so many different fighters. Uh, you know, the key, mobility. Stay mobile, go after most legs and body early on in a round. Tire him out. Once he gets tired, Mo tends to start dropping his hands, and that's when Mr. K1 goes to the head with his devastating head kicks. I still see this fight 
if Peter Arts was to win, it would have to be by a judge's decision. I just don't see him uh, finishing Mo. his key to victory here. He needs to create angles, try to avoid the leg kicks from uh, Peter Arts, and try to deliver that overhand right. I see him winning this fight early on in a round. The longer the rounds go, the more less chances he has in winning. Mighty Mo, who brings in a kickboxing record overall of 16 and 11 with 12 knockouts. Peter Arts, who in the final 16 in Seoul, fought in his 100th career fight. And look at the conditioning. I mean, 40-year-old veteran who made his K1 debut in the very first K1 Grand Prix back in 1993. And you know, it's his corner tonight, the man who won that Grand Prix, Branko Sikacic, and also reunited with the great Tom Harring. Let's go up for the official ring introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our quarterfinal fight number one. It is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting tonight out of the blue corner. He stands 192 centimeters tall and weighed in at 107 kilograms. Here is the three-time K1 World Grand Prix champion from Holland, Peter the Dutch Lumberjack or And his opponent across the ring fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 185 centimeters tall and weighed in at 125 kilograms. Here is the K1 World Grand Prix 2004 Las Vegas champion and K1 USA Grand Prix 2007 champion from the United States of America, Mighty Moore. American Ma Samoan Mighty Mo, who came to Tokyo by himself without a corner crew, has enlisted Fire for Lemoyne, the Golden Gloves boxer from Team Michigeki in his corner here tonight. And what a moment there. Tom Harrink, who guided Peter Ertz to the 1994 and 95 back-to-back -back K1 crowns, once again in Peter's corner, along with Branko Sikatik, Murad Bazidi, and all the crew. Mo comes in at plus 215, Ertz at minus 275. Yeah. It is quarterfinal number one. Michael Chevello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lawal with you. And Mighty Mo, as we expected, trying to bull rush Ertz early on to land those massive car batteries of hands. Ertz has got a sling to the legs. Mo's going to set the overhand right. He was the only man ever to knock out Hongman Choi with an overhand right at the Yokohama yeah, Arena yeah. in 2007. Peter Ertz, a gut-munching knee, belly button through the back as they tango into the neutral corner. Hey. Ertz, high kick off the lead leg. Mighty Mo with the left hook and he takes a groin shot. It is the most attacked groin region in all the world of fight sports, surely is the groin of Mighty Mo, still unrecovered from the Dream 13 fight against Josh Barnett, surely Mike. I was just getting ready to say, Mighty Mo must have a giant groin because he has yet to fight anyone who misses it. I mean, everybody goes through his groin. I think it is giant because he's got like 2,000 kids. Yeah, so it's, right, it's, 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 it's got to be material. Giant. They recommence here. A slim down Mighty Mo at 275 pounds, the heaviest man in this lineup here tonight. And Peter Rose ties him up and drills it. Double knee to the upper right rib cage of Mo. So far, it looks like the concept of 
staying away from uh, from Peter's kicks is what Mo is after, but just his execution is a little poor. He kind of bum rushes him, and it ends up tied up where he can't do anything either. He needs to try to find a little more angles in his uh, in his attacks. Peter Rose, who comes up a fantastic extra round decision. We know oh, the big come on! That was Ansabold! A high left round kick whipped around the back of the neck as mighty Mo went down! First knockdown. One more and it's all over here. Can Ernst finish? Ernst goes to the inside thigh. Winds up the lead leg round kick again. And Mighty Mo tries a bull rush once more. Mighty's either still on the queer street or he's just really tired already. In the midsection from Ernst. Mo's going to be careful not to drop that one hand. Or Ernst will thread the Mawashi Gary yet again. Fantastic start here from Mr. K1, Peter Ertz. Jab overhand right by Mo. He caught nothing but air. Nice five punch combination. Oh, it's all over! It's good night, Irene! Peter Ertz, you crazy old man! You're through to the semis again! Wow, I mean, what a phenomenal performance by Peter. You know, he really did. Just about everything I said he did, he just did it with more conviction and really knocked out Mighty Mo. I mean, who would have thought that? King Mo, oh wow, your first time seeing Peter Earth's live. Welcome to K1. Man, that was amazing. It was very amazing. Uh, you know, at least uh, Mighty Mo can to compete, but Peter Earth is just too much for him. Way too much. Peter Earth scores a first round KKO. To the side of the jaw, Mighty Mo going down for the first time. That was just Peter Ertz of old, Mike, with his trainer of old back in his corner. And my new theory might be coming alive here. If Peter looks like this in his second fight, we might just see him in the final. And untouched, unscathed, and fresh Peter Ertz steps out of the ring. There you see the second knockdown of Mighty Mo. The old dog showing he still has plenty of tricks, Peter Ertz. As he becomes the first man through to the semifinals. He moves in front of our commentary position, does Ertz. Now advances to the semifinal round. What a moment here. And folks, coming up next, quarterfinal number two, Simi Schultz takes on Kiltaro. What do you think the strongest man in the world would be like? Would he be like me? My name is Sam Shields, I'm four time K1 champion. As many times as I want to. So, uh, if you think that I'm a boring fighter, yeah. Then maybe that's a compliment because then uh, I can avoid uh, punches uh, as good. あいつを日本人が世界最強の男に対してしっかり向かっていく姿っていうのを見せてあげたいですよね。日本人の人に。アーツにも勝った。バンナにも勝っ
っただから今度はシュルトに勝つしかしシュルトの心は京太郎にあらず I don't know who made this poster. The K1 made it. Does the K1 dream of Alistair becoming a champion? But it's also a dream.、Uh, I am the champion, and、uh, if they want to put him in front, they have to do that. You know, that's not my concern. I just want to win, and when I win, I'm the champion, and then they can make me as small as they want. But I'm still the biggest. I don't care. I want to have the crown in the end and the belt, and then.、Uh, We see who's laughing. You know, it's like it's one so it's actually me. Do you want to take a look at the one who got the girl got the only side of the party? Condo, look at the bar, more bank cross, you don't know, all bank cross and out of one day. So, I mean, I'm sorry. So, you're a hot as the city, not on. Champion Kyotaro, of whom you are seeing a new incarnation. Gone is the rat's tail. Gone are the garish shorts and the little tail behind him. It is a Kyotaro focused on dethroning Semi Shield here in the quarterfinals. And could he do it with that beautiful counter right hand? Mike Hogan, that's going to be the key here for Kyotaro to land that counter right. The key's going to have to be here some speed. He has to dictate the pace of this fight. He has to find angles. I think early on, go after Sammy Shields' massive body. Really rip it into the body and hurt Sammy early on, and then be able to open up for the counter overhead. Kyotaro, who said he got into K1 because he wanted to be on television. He said that being here in the final lines is a boyhood dream come true. And what a dream it would be if he could somehow find a way to defeat the seemingly unstoppable Semi Shield here tonight. He scales the ropes, does Kiltaro. And the man who has beaten Menhoff, beaten Saki, beaten Labana, and knocked out Peter Ernst. Is in centering in the K1 Grand Prix for the very first time.
most imposing sights in all the world of combat sports is surely Simi Schultz with his black belt and his gi stomping his way to the K1 ring. The seemingly unstoppable four-time and defending champion who won the tournament for a fourth time last year in world record time. How does he beat Kyotaro here tonight, Mike? Well, in Simi's case, you know, the formula is simple. He's got it in spades. He uses his jab and his reach. Uh, front kick followed by the knees. The only key to Sammy's victory here would have to be have to adjust it to be able to trap Kyotaro. Kyotaro's a very mobile fighter. Sammy's got to find a way to cut off the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our quarterfinal fight number two. It is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands 183 centimeters tall and weighed in at 107.5 kilograms. Tonight, he is making his K-1 World Grand Prix debut. Let's welcome from Japan, Kyotaro. <laughs> and his opponent across the ring fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 212 centimeters tall and weighed in at 131.5 kilograms. Here is the four-time K-1 World Grand Prix champion from Holland, High Tower, Semi Field. It is the K-1 World Super Heavyweight Champion versus the K-1 Heavyweight Champion. Semi Shields at six foot 11, 294 pounds. Officially, though, he is a little leaner than that. Kyotaro, six foot even, 218. It is quarterfinal number two. The winners to take on Peter Ertz in semi final number one after Ertz just knocked out Mighty Mo in the first round. Kyotaro comes in as the underdog, plus 500. Schultz, the favorite, at minus 700. And I believe we are about to have the national anthems here. Sellout crowd here at the Ariaki Coliseum giving it up for Rima on the Japanese national anthem as quarterfinal number two is about to begin between Semi Schultz and Kyotaro. <laughs> Could Kyotaro pull off what would be the biggest upset perhaps in K1 history? Look at the towering semi shot here, 6'11 versus 6 foot even. You've got to wonder what the game plan will be of Kyotaro to try and get on the inside 
of the best jab in the business. Kyotaro, who is sporting the Prajur here tonight, the Thai armbands around both biceps. Always worn by Muay Thai fighters, of which his coach is a former. Usually blessed by Buddhist monks, the Prajur, one of the many good luck amulets that Muay Thai fighters wear. Usually along with the Mong Kon and the floral arrangement around the neck. Go first round of action. Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan, Kim Mola Wall with you. Kyotaro will do his best Forrest Gump impersonation and run around the ring. He'll look to counter fight Semi. Semi will try and press him against the ropes. He'll use that lead leg front kick. He digs the balls of the feet into the liver, into the midsection, and that time into the groin. He also likes a good step up knee. Sits behind a jab that he can use to knock out opponents. Equally strong of both hands is Semi Schultz. Kyotaro, you see already, is preferring to circle into the right hand of Semi rather than circle into the jab. And there's the first taste of that jab from Schultz. Checks the low kick. Kyotaro will need a minuscule opening to rush on in and try and plant the big bok choy with that overhand right. Easier said than done though, because have a look at the way that Schultz just cuts off the ring with a couple of steps. He is a truly Herculean figure, the man they call the high tower. Head kick. Jotaro now circles to the lead hand of Semi as he changes it up and moves forward with his first flurry. Semi being very cautious here as well. He's aware of that power in the right hand of Kyotaro. Kyotaro knocked out Melvin Manoff with that right hand. He knocked out Peter Erz with that right hand. But he has never fought somebody 6'11". Nice inside leg kick on the femoral profunda there from Kyotaro. I'm liking what I'm seeing out of Kyotaro so far. He's just trying to find his range still, but he's very mobile. And Semi so far is having a difficulty cutting him off and getting him to, uh, you know, somewhere in a corner where he can unload. And there it is, the first power flurry from Kyotaro. And every time the K1 heavyweight champion lands, this capacity crowd here at the Ariaki Coliseum cheers. How it would be a major upset if Kyotaro can take out Semi Schultz. Schultz has never lost an eight-man tournament he's been in, be it a regional K1 tournament or four Grand Prix. High knee from Simic. We've seen him use that to great effect. And the final 16 a few years ago against Paul Slowinski was probably the best example. Kyotaro said at yesterday's media conference, I am prepared to die in center ring to bring pride to Japan. I am going to make Japan a happy nation. He's doing a good job fighting. I think he's doing a great job, great game plan. Um, he just needs to land the right hand and see how, uh, how it affects him. Slippery and evasive as Kyotaro is proving harder to catch than Osama Bin Laden. One round down, two remaining, Mike. Your thoughts? I would give it a 10, 10 all round, but what, what I'm starting to see is that Kyotaro, while being mobile, Semi's able to find the time to land a few knees and a few punches, and it's all he needs to slowly soften him up. I want to see Kyotaro create a little more angles uh, when he's moving around the ring. Don't just circle around. Kimo Kyotaro, very evasive, but is he showing you enough signs yet that he could pose headaches for Semi? Well, I think if he come, takes the Sergio Martinez route and is in and out with flurries, that he can do this, he, he could he could fight effectively like that, but he's not throwing any flurries, he's just circling too much. Thanks for everyone watching our broadcast right around the world, particularly a big hello to all of our fans across North America watching live on HDNet. We hope you're enjoying the 18th annual Fields K1 World Grand Prix from the Ariaki Coliseum in Tokyo. Semichuk comes out jabbing. And Kyotaro again doing his sea biscuit, galloping around the ring. Yeah, circling clockwise. And now he drifts off counterclockwise. Shook dangerously is looking to set his rhythm on that lead leg round kick. 
referee warning both men here. You've got to beware of that cheap kick of Semi, the one he used to to feed Jerome Labetta last year that he digs into the liver section. There's the high knee again. First round it was Semi short 10-9 and all three judges scorecards. There's that high left round kick followed by that beautiful stiff jab. Semi Schultz has the work rate of a middleweight fighter, Mike. It is scary. Mike, unfortunately, I'm starting to, well, I mean, unfortunately for Kyotaro, I'm starting to see Semi find his rhythm. He's really found that rhythm and he's found the timing that Kyotaro uses in moving around. He needs to create more angles and not just circle around and go to the body. Kyotaro is reaching valiantly for the jawline, but to no avail so far. And the monstrous Schultz just controlling. Checks the low kick, Kyotaro with the counter, but it fell two gloves short. Again, the referee warning for clinching on the inside. Maeda in the corner there of Kyotaro, barking instructions for his charge. And Simi's jab is just landing, you know, at will. You know, that's West went, that's the thing, he's the, he's the range, the timing. The jab is what sets everything up, and he's doing a great job landing that jab. It is the finest jab in all of K1, that of Semi Schultz. And look again as he cuts off the ring and throws the knee to the temple of Kyotaro. And Kyotaro just does not have the opportunity to counter here. Semi not overextending himself. You still feel he's only fighting at about 75% of his capabilities. As Kyotaro lands a glancing right hand, but glancing a best mind. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the thing I don't like is he's, he's linear in his attack. He needs to attack under angles. He needs to get duck the jab and come in with the body shots. Instead, he's just trying to cover up. That is playing right into Sammy's game plan. Double forearms gone from Kyotaro. Semi lumbers forward again. Kyotaro tries to back him up with the left hook. Semi always working. His output is just extraordinary. It is what has made him the most feared fighter, perhaps, in K1 history. His output, his power, his range. He is still the man to beat here in K1. Despite not getting top billing on the official poster, which seemed to, well, distress him a little over the last week, as you saw in the pre-fight video. Two rounds down, one remaining. King Mo, if you're in the corner here of Kyotaro, what are you telling the heavyweight champion to do? Man, I'd be like, go crazy. It's the third round. Just go crazy. Do what you gotta do to get this, you know, do something. Because, you know, Sam is like a damn shark out there, landing whatever he wants, and he's stalking them, and he's just controlling everything. He's, look, look at that, you know, landing everything. Semi Schultz at minus 135 to win the tournament overall. Minus 700 to beat Kyotaro. And once again, two judges give it to Semi. One judge gives it a draw. Who will face Peter Ertz in semi final number one, side A of the draw? Kyotaro has three minutes remaining to turn the tide. Jab again from Schultz. Jab two from the high tower. Kiltaro seems to have a little more gusto behind him now, but still just having trouble getting on the inside. He rushes forward and swings for the heavens. And Schultz just stamping his authority consistently here, dominating center ring. Pushing Kyotaro to the outside. Now Kyotaro with the overhand left and went so high, St. Peter knocked it back. You feel the frustration, Mike, creeping in now for Kyotaro. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, his game plan is not working. Just circling is not working. Sammy's got his timing. Sammy's doing exactly what he does. And Kyotaro's really lost at this point. He really does not know what else to do. The only positive note to come out of this so far, from a tournament perspective, is that perhaps Kyotaro can take Semi the distance here and maybe try and deplete his gas tank a little. 
should he front up against a very fresh Peter Ertz in the semi-finals. But the thing about Simi, as we've seen over the years, Mike, is he just gets stronger as tournaments yeah, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, that's just wishful thinking. Uh, Semi Shield has a never-ending gas tank. Uh, you know, Semi Shield is a machine. Uh, you see there, even in the tango, even in the clinch, Short just pops up that little short knee to the upper rib cage. Always working. Semi Shield. Yeah, I mean, Semi Shield, this is a training session for him. As a matter of fact, I saw highlights of his training sessions for this fight, and this is perfect. This is exactly what he was doing in training. Dave Yonkers and the team from Golden Glory in Zubladen. Semi does not train with the major Golden Glory gym alongside Overeem or Errol Zimmerman. He is exclusively out in the sticks, yelling at trees, breaking locks. And the referee gives an official caution for Kyotaro for clinching. And blocking sunlight for the villagers. <laughs> By a very pale Inswood Laren. And again, two, three jabs landed by Simi Schultz. He's taking more hits than Miley Cyrus's bomb is Kyotaro here in the final round. If Kyotaro was a little taller, maybe like two or three inches taller, he, he'd be landing those right hands and those left hooks a lot, you know, a lot, actually a lot more, but he missed them due to size. Mike, you've got to take your hat off if you're wearing a hat, though, to the tenacity and the gallant fighting heart here of Kyotaro. Most definitely. I mean, Kyotaro is, is game. Uh, you know, he's come prepared for his fight uh, mentally and physically. He just seems to be failing at the game plan. I don't really know what their game plan was, but I think it was to come in and out, and that's just not happening. But, hey, he's fighting a four-time World Grand Prix champion and a favorite to become the fifth. That's a tall order. from Kyotaro. And that will be all. Simi Schultz will advance to the semi-finals to take on his old arch rival, Peter Ertz. I want to take this time to send some shout outs to uh, my boys from Fairtax that are watching live this in San Jose, California. And my uh, second family, my Strike Force family, my boys and girls are watching it. And their leader, your boss actually, Scott Coker. <laughs> I know he's watching it. Much love to you. I'm done. That, that's it. As we see Kyotaro get airborne there and try and fire the hammer fist strike and a left hook. It was just desperation from Kyotaro. As His Highness King Mo said, if he was a couple of inches taller, he may have landed a couple of salvos, but alas, it was not to be. Semi Schultz makes it through to the semi final round yet again. 30 27, 30 27, 30 28. Two quarter finals down. Semi final number one will be Peter Ertz versus Semi Schultz. Yeah, Semi is very strong. He's three time champion and uh, he's Semi Shields is very strong. But, as soon as he got to the end, he was very strong. He was very strong. He was very strong. Ik ben uh, nog serieus gaan leven van de sport. Ik uh, vind het gewoon uh, helemaal top waar ik nu ben en wat ik allemaal uh, de afgelopen jaar gedaan heb. Hiervoor uh, hebben we drie problemen voor zijn jongen te maken. Ik heb nu nog een tijd om te houden mijn kwaliteit en te doen voor de morgen. En dan heb ik nog een tijdje om te gaan. Ik heb nog een tijdje om te gaan. Ik heb nog een tijdje om Ik heb een heel hoop geleerd van het jaar 2009. Ik heb gewoon gezworen tegen mezelf dat ik gewoon weer ga komen waar ik stond in 2008. Ik sta Ik ben heel erg trots op mezelf. Ik zat ik vast mijn lijf voor uh, te doen. Ik heb een foto van de final. En nu ben ik hier. De inzet wat ik toon moet dubbel zijn. 
dan een Daniel Gita, dan een Errol Zimmerman, dan een Alistair Overeem. Ik moet er dubbel voor doen, maar ik hou van mijn sport en ik wil gewoon die K1 winnen, dus daar doe ik dan ook gewoon moeite voor. For to be the best in the world, you must be complete, like uh, in power, like a technical, like uh, uh, arms and uh, the legs. You must uh, be complete. I'm not the dark horse. I'm the winner this year. Romania no AU, Daniel Rujita. I think it's the best moment in my life in uh, in 11 December. advantage and spend the first round keeping Saki at, on the outside, tenderize him with leg, leg kicks, slow him down, and circle. Every time Saki comes in on the inside to attack the body, circle out of the way and throw some hooks. What a 
moment here for Saki. Mike, how does he take care of business against Gita? Saki has to use his speed, get on the inside, and go after the body and overhead. That's really what Saki is good at. Come in, attack, get out. If Gita is trying to throw good leg kicks, make sure to circle and come in on the inside. Saki, who was so impressive in that violent performance against Freddy Camayo in the final 16. A Muay Thai stylist, he won his first Muay Thai world title in 2003. Won the Super Heavyweight World Title in 2008 with a leg kick knockout of Englishman Chris Knowles in Shadem, which is where Saki was born. Comes in tonight on a fantastic five fight winning streak, including a world title defense over Woodley Mariana by first round knockout in February. A decision in Singha Jadeep in April. A second round over Melbourne Manoff in Amsterdam. And that ferocious first round raping of Freddy Camayo in Ladies Seoul. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our quarterfinal fight number three. It is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands 195 centimeters tall and weighed in at 112 kilograms. He is the first Romanian to ever qualify for the K-1 World Grand Prix. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Romania, Daniel Gita. <laughs> and his opponent across the ring, fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 182 centimeters tall and weighed in at 103 kilograms. Here is the K1 World Grand Prix 2008 USA Tournament Champion from Turkey, Gupan Gorenko Saki. How come Saki, who has tremendous support here tonight, they have flown out from Holland and Turkey in their droves. A bigger entourage than Vincent Chase for Gokhan Saki. In his corner, Core Hemmers. In the corner of Daniel Gita, Anil Durba. Their stare down at yesterday's media conference was prolific. Neither man wanted to break the stare. We are set for three by three minute rounds. One extra round in case of a draw. The two knockdown rule in any round is in application here. For quarterfinal number three of the Fields K1 World Grand Prix 2010. Who will go through to semi-final number two to face either Overeem or Tyrone Spong? Michael Chevello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lawal with your ringside. Saki comes in at plus 128, Gita minus 158. Gita at plus 500 to win the tournament overall. Saki at plus 750. And you see the early leaks being exchanged here. Saki fakes the right hand, goes to the left hook, trying to curl it over the top of the right glove of Gita. Saki is so fast, so dangerous, and Gita is power. Turn him back into the midsection, Uchiro Giri from Gokan Saki, and he checks the low kick. Both men are renowned for their incredible kicking power, and there you see the explosiveness of Saki. With Kyotaro eliminated, Saki is now the smallest man in the tournament. Nice round kick, looking for the liver section there off the lead leg from Daniel Gita. Stiff jab from Saki. And Gita now kicking the opposite side of the body. I like the leg work here from the Romanian. Tenderizing the left side of the carcass. Oh, Saki dumped to the liver like he was digging for oil. And he cracks the back leg. This is the brilliant contest we thought it would be. He backs up Gita with the left hand of Saki. Fakes the leg kick and rips through the right. What speed here, Mike? Wow, I mean, that is all you can say. How fast is Gokan Saki? So far, I mean, both guys are implementing their game plan. I'd like to see Saki get a little more on the inside. I I'm not liking him getting too many kicks from Gita, but so far, a perfect fight. Gita at 65 has the height, has the reach over Saki. Oh, nice team kick to the thigh there. Pure Muay Thai technique from Saki, and he rips away to the lead quadriceps. 
But Saki is taking a lot of body punishment here, King Mo. And Saki's like the uh, Turkish Speedy Gonzalez. He's so quick in his combos and his reaction time. He's to get his speed going again because he's standing too still right now. You can see the left side of the body of Gokan Saki is reddened. It looks like it's been barbecued. 40 seconds remaining here in the stellar first round. Beautiful high left round kick from Saki, the switch kick. That's what I want to see out of Saki. Come in when the when the kick is coming in. Don't stand there and just take him. I think it might be a little bit of an ego thing, you know, because Saki is known for his leg kicks. The lean back like Fat Joe, and then he counters. Beautifully done from Saki. Gita looking through his forearms. The chin tucks. A nice boxing guard on the Romanian. Oh, you hear that thud resound across this massive auditorium. And Saki goes to the liver, and we go to the towers. King Mo Lowell, your highness, how did you see the first round? Hey, even even round right there, man. Uh, great action. This is what I came to see right here, just like all the other fights. But this fight right here is very intriguing, and it's playing out to be a great fight so far. You know, I mean, the fight is living up to its expectations. We, we, we knew it was going to be a war, and it is a war. Gokan Saki, I think, is doing everything he needs to do to win this fight. Like I said, the only thing I don't like is that he's standing in a reach uh, of Gita's kicks. He just we really he needs to close a little more distance and attack a little more to the body and the head. Otherwise, he's playing a perfect fight. So far, the fight, I think, is going more Gita's way. Not as far as points, but just as far as strategy. Two judges give it a four. One judge gives it 10-9 to Daniel Gita. So just the slightest whisker ahead, Daniel Gita after one. The winner will take on either Alistair Overeem or Tyrone Spock. Second round. Saki has got to get on the inside. As he fakes the right cross, throws the inside leg kick. Head kick from Gita. Oh, turning back in the game there from Saki. High left round kick. And Saki returns the favor. That is an epic effort to get the kick up that high to six foot five of Gita. And indeed to go over the top of the Romanian's head. Tip kick again to the lead fire. I like these little Muay Thai techniques that Gokan Saki is throwing. But he's got to follow through with his hands. He's got to get on the inside of these long legs of Gita. Left hook from Saki. Nicely done. Turn the knuckles in. Now he's got Gita pressed towards the neutral corner, but he does not capitalize. Saki kicks to the back leg. Yeah, I mean, this is the time to come on the inside and really go after that body. He let Gita off the hook there. And look at Gita's gloves just glued to his ears. And Gita says, Is that all you've got, Gokan? Which you is usually the sign of. That. Being hurt. Being hurt. Tag. Muay Thai fighters, when you hit them, will smile at you. Liver kick there from Gita. This is the type of fight you want to have going to the next round right here. This is this is tough right here. These two men are taking tremendous punishment, particularly to their bodies. And yes, indeed, as King Mo said, it will not all go well for either one of them. Who goes through to the semi-final round. Inside leg kick to that femoral artery. Saki checks the next one. He slowed down a little here, has Gokan Saki. Gita is scoring points with his kicks in this round. Saki, nice rip to the liver section. Good combination work there from Gita. The hands weren't working, but the inside leg kick landed. So too the right hand there from Saki. Left hook counter. Saki's going nice and high on that inside thigh. But he's just lacking a little bit of starch, a little bit of snap here in the second round by. And that's courtesy of taking all those leg kicks and the body kicks. As I said before, Gita's victory, Kido victory, slow Kaku Saki down. Go after his body, go after his legs, and that's exactly what he did. But I think Saki almost let him do it. 
outside leg kick from Sarkic. He switches to southpaw momentarily here. Now back to Orthodox. No knockdown. Stop. End of the second round, one more round to go. Daniel Keita seemingly in control here, Mike. Daniel Keita is systematically imposing his strategy, which right now we can see just by how excited his corner is in, in their direction is go after the legs, tenderize the body, slow him down, get him tired. You'll open him up in the third round. Saki has taken a lot of unnecessary punishment. He could have used his speed early on to get on the inside and go after the body. And King Molawal, this fight is an example as to why K1 is the highest level of striking in the world. You would think this is on fast forward. The speed, especially that Keita is throwing these thunderous kicks with. Well, this case of vicious, man. Uh, he's finding his range. He has, he has Gokusaki in his range and his sight. It's perfect. And now, this does really intrigue me here because all three judges surprisingly gave the second round a draw 10 points apiece. I thought Keita had it, King Mo. I thought Gita had it, but you know what? <laughs> hey, Why things happen. Not? Here we go, third and final round. So uh, Gita still just slightly ahead. And Saki is not done yet. He has got to get on the inside, though. Oh, and a spinning hook kick. Now, in Turkey, one of the national sports is Taekwondo. And a lot of Turkish kickboxers have emanated from a Taekwondo background and do have brilliant kicking arsenals. Nice body shot there from Saki. And a tip kick to the midsection. Goes to the lead fight. That's better point scoring from Saki. He's backing up Keita now. Keita, double round kick off the left leg. Effective for the Romanian. Saki is going head hunting now with these looping punches. Double to the body. Right hand to the temple. It seems like Gita's kind of slowing down a little bit, or he's looking to counter. But Saki needs to pick his output up and uh, he can... Oh. No knockdown, says the referee. Tip kick from Saki, I love that. Back leg tip kick, step through right hand. Boom to the lead thigh goes Saki. You can feel, you can see Saki's really digging deep here to try to impress the judges and try to steal this round. So you can at least go into an extension round. Turning back again from Saki, the follow through is a little slower and Gita almost made him pay. Halfway through the third and final round of quarterfinal number three. And Saki goes back to that inside thigh of Gita. Kick to the back leg. Big chomping leg kick from Saki. But one thing is that Gita is not capitalizing on Saki being tired, you're right, it almost looks like he's starting to get tired himself. He didn't throw, he didn't throw his body kick as much as he was the first two rounds. Oh, Saki, a beautiful body shot and comes over the top with the right hand. It's an effective round so far for Gokan Saki. Again, he lowers the boom to the midsection. Great round for Gokan Saki. If he wins by at least two judges, he could win this entire fight. He gets on the inside of the left hand to Saki and count as well. The chance go up for Saki. I think Saki is delivering it. Gita has slowed down here in the final round. No starch behind the right hand of Gita. Saki with the overhand right and the left hook. Saki's punches fighting their target. Final 10 seconds. I think Saki stole this fight here in, a, in the third round, guys. Has Gokan Saki gone for the Germanian and stolen it? We will go down to the judges. I'll tell you what, though, King Mo, an extension round would not be beyond question here. Well, uh, they better hope there's not one because uh, the next round is a tough battle for um, either one of these fighters. So hopefully, uh, you know, it comes with a decision right now. But if it doesn't, these guys are in for a long night. I have Saki winning this round enough to win this fight. But you're right. It could go into the extension round. But I think Saki sucked it up towards the end. Have a look at this here. Between the eyes, the right hand of Gokan Saki. He was scoring well with the punches when he got on the inside in that final round. And we go down to the decision. Okay.
First judge goes to Daniel Kita. Second judge at draw. It is an extension round. We are going one more. Now quickly, King Molawal, what does Gita need to do? He needs to keep on going back to the body with the leg kicks, control the, control the range and pace. Because he starts slowing down, he needs to pick it back up and go back to the body and the legs. Mike Kogan, what does Saki need to do? I think Saki needs to do what he started doing towards the end. Get more on the inside. Don't stay on the outside taking the unnecessary punishment. Come on the inside, liver overhand. Liver overhand all day, it's been landing. Final instructions from Anil Duba and Core Hemmers in the respective corners here. Extension Saki comes out kicking, probing with the teeth kick off the back leg. Keita's looking for the liver, and he finds it. The organ smasher. Body rip from Saki, but he's got to continue to press when Geeta is backed against the ropes. Good jab there from Geeta, threaded it. Saki tagged with an uppercut outside Saki combination. The chance go up once again for Gokan Saki. He switches to Southpaw momentarily here, Saki. Now back to Orthodox. Chops the back leg. Off the ropes, he has to fight in the center because uh, this right here is gonna help, it's gonna make him lose the round. No, Saki's taking over this fight, it really is. But he just got to get a little closer. I don't understand why he likes to uh, why, why he stands on his kicking range right there. Train of leg kicks, Saki kills the right hand over the top, make it two in a row. Halfway through the extension round, Keith is gonna start to unload his hands a little now. Gita needs to get busy, he's giving his fight away. I mean, at this point, he really needs to get busy because Saki is stealing this fight. I thought he won the third round. I'm definitely having him ahead here. Saki, that little tape kick, then he goes to the carcass once more. 60 seconds remaining. The body shuttle score for Saki. Succulent dropping down to the liver. Overhand right, just whistled past the brow of the Romanian. Saki again, going for the liver, a tip to the lead thigh, overhand right. He's got more combinations than a Sudoku puzzle as Gokan Saki. And they're scoring for him here in this extension round. Catches the round kick on the forearms. Both men are tired. Gita's got to go balls to the wall now for the final 20 seconds. I think Saki got this round. He looked like he outworked him, controlled the pace, controlled where the fight went as far as uh, who went move forward and backwards. He, I think he got this round. Mike? I'd have to, I'd have to agree. I, I think it's a little, a lot closer round than most fans would think. Gita did, you know, quite a bit of damage himself, but I think that the pace of the fight was dictated by Gokan Saki, and that usually impresses the judges. I give this fight to Gokan Saki, but boy, are these, ba are these guys gonna be banged up. First judge to Saki. He's done it! Gokan Saki, his corner, are absolutely jubilated. Saki is through to the semi-finals, but the question mark will be, 
just how much punishment did Saki take, especially to his body, from the kicks of Gita, and how will that affect him if he takes on either Overeem or Tyrone Spock? Daniel Gita, the first ever Romanian to qualify for the K1 World Grand Prix, did his country proud. And Gokhan Saki will head back to the change rooms with Core Hammers and the crew. They will ice him down. They will rehydrate him and prepare him for another war. Folks, up next, quarterfinal number four, the Reem and Tyrone Spock. I remember when I was eight, I watched WWF, Hulk Hogan, and I loved it. And uh, it's funny that I, later on in life, I'm a real fighter, because WWF is fake. K1 に衝撃と恐怖を呼び起こしたそして今年ついにこの史上最強のマッスルモンスターが頂点への階段を駆け上がる I think I'm、uh, more strong, more fast, more athletic than a lot of other K1 fighters I think I'm strategic, I think I'm、uh, always want to go for the knockout 狙うは常に K1 のみ I'm very happy. I'm very happy that I have Alistair in my first fight. And、uh, then I can show everybody what I'm about. ミドル級からヘビー級へ最大の挑戦が始まるタイロン・スポーンスリナムキング・オブ・ザ・リングとしてヨーロッパでは無敵の強さを誇った天才ファイターが唯一手にしていないタイトルこそ K1 そして彼はミドル級という体格ながら 2m100kg が居並ぶ K1 ヘビー級戦線に殴り込みをかけることを決意In the middle weight, and the, the, the weight is anymore, so I had to move up. And now that I moved up,、uh, then you have to, to get some motivation and to get at that top level from the heavyweights too. And that's, that's what, what, what motivates me, and that's what keeps、uh, pushing me, you know. So, in the middle of the day, the Cruiser Q is a very good one. エビ級で戦うための体を手にした。エビ級のアフィエス、フォーム、フォーム、ミドルウェイファイター、76、トゥ、アフィウェイ、アンデン、アフターダッド、メイビー、ワンアンアフィエス、トゥ、メイケット、ウィンダー、ワンオファイフ。パワーアップを果たしたキングオブザリングは、マッスルモンスターを捉えることができるのか。I want to be the best. I want to be the champion in K1. I already am champion in MMA. For me, the next thing is champion, K1 championship. Then you're the strongest. Say, sir, do I? Wazaka? Chikaraka? Arista Oflame vs. Tyron Spoon. Check me out right here, yo. 
Create angles, attack Alistair, but the key is keep his attacks off rhythm. Don't let Alistair find the rhythm in his offense to be able to counter. We have never seen Tyrone Spong at 105 kilos, and he is carrying the weight well. He goes over the top ropes as all Muay Thai fighters do when they enter the ring, and Spong looks ready for business. having a look up in the ring here and Tyrone leaning over the top ropes and barking to us here Mike my word I have never seen Tyrone this charged up for a fight he looks like a man on the brink of insanity or maybe pushed over the edge and listen to the ovation lock up your horses the ream is in the house the Herculean figure of Alistair Overeem. He really does not need an introduction in the fighting world. Mike, what does the Reem need to do here to take care of business against Spock? The thing with Reem is much like Semi, he has his own style that has worked for him in just about every one of his K1 fights, and that's stock his opponent down, cut off the ring, don't let him get mobile, and counter. He needs to get Tyrone engaged in in offense to be able to counter him with just about anything he wants. An uppercut, overhand, right, he's done it all. Knee, you name it. He's got a lot of weapons. The Reem versus Spong, as Spong stirs him down. Former stablemates at the Lucian Carbine, now Ladies ready to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Final fight number four. It is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting tonight out of the blue corner. He stands 188 centimeters tall and weighed in at 103.5 kilograms. Tonight, he is making his K1 World Grand Prix debut. 
from Suriname. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Tyrone, King of the Ring. Oh. And his opponent across the ring fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 195 centimeters tall and weighed in at 119 kilograms. Coming to us from Poland, here is Alistair, the Reem Overeem. Alistair Overeem has been doing all the publicity here in Japan. He is mega popular, is the man they call Overeem. The stare down here. Spong is making Overeem wait. You see the great one, Ernesto Hoost in the corner there of Tyrone Spong. It's an old tactic to make the opponent wait for you. As Spong is already playing the mind games here. Look at Overeem. He looks like he is ready to eat Tyrone Spong. Three by three minute rounds. One extra round in case of a draw. The intensity on Spong. He could beat the Sun in a staring contest. Spong comes in at plus 365. Overeem at minus 465. This one has epic awesomeness written all over it. Quarterfinal number four. And Spong is ready to charge out of his corner. Overeem, can he find the Uber knee? Michael Chavello, Mike Hogan, King Mo Lawal with you. Overeem will switch. He started in Southport, now back to Orthodox. Tyrone Spong has a beautiful liver shot and a fantastic left hook. And he gets on the outside of the Overeem right hand. Spong says he has trained specifically for Uberin. He's beefed up to 105 kilograms for the first time in his career. But Overeem needs to find only one shot. The overhand right, the high knee. Alistair opened pretty aggressive, uh, which is usually uncharacteristic of him. Overeem switches again. Southpaw now back to Orthodox. The big double-handed clinch is illegal. Referee will caution Overeem here. You are allowed to clinch with one hand and then release. And some angry barks from the corner of Tyrone Spine. As Alistair has officially worn. 265 pounds of Overeem here tonight. He's been training the last two weeks in Patea, Thailand. And the Golden Glory can. Here comes Spock, double left foot. Oh, Spock's tagged it. Overeem's been robbed. Spock unloading. And Overeem's double forearm guards weather the storm. Overeem rock solid. That virgin's defense, nothing penetrates. Spock with the leg kicks. Stiff jab, and Overeem, pull under pressure, he gets kicked with another left hook, body shot from Spong, inside leg kick from Spong, there's the liver shot, and Overeem switches to Southpaw, now back to Orthodox, the high knee from the Reem. I don't know, Alistair doesn't look like he's surprised by any of this, I mean this is all part of his strategy, it looks like he was defending relatively well. I don't like Spong standing stationary, allowing Alistair to, to clinch and deliver that knee. He needs to move a little more. I see Spong dangerously dropping his right hand. Alistair may capitalize with a left hook. There's the uppercut off the left from Alistair over him. Spong with a counter hook of his own. Inside thigh kick, nice and high on the thigh. And a step up knee. Alistair returns the favor. And to be honest with you, I think those body shots hurt him. That's why he switched stances. I have to agree with you, King Mo. Over he moves it again. Double handed clinch. Referee's going to caution him again. And he may very well issue a yellow card here to Over him. Tyrone Spong's manager, Raymond, is having to be restrained here ringside. He is absolutely irate. The second official warning for Overeem for an illegal double-handed clinch. Overhand right from the ring, the one he used to drop Ben Edwards in the final 16 in Seoul. Look at the size of the trapezius here of the ring. He could fly. Everything Alistair throws is with mean, mean intentions. 
Nice shot to the end. Left side of the carcass from Alistair. There's that beautiful double forearms defense again from the ring. He's finding South Corner. Step up knee. Tyrone got to remain mobile here. Final 10 seconds of what has been the most thrilling round of the night. Glancy right hand. End of the first round, we go to the towels. Kick Mo Lawal, your highness. How did you see it? I thought Spong won that. You know, I thought he won that round uh, early, just, just from the early action in the fight. And uh, the rest of the round went pretty even, but uh, I think Spong won that round. Mike Kogan, how did you see it on Kogan Vision? Uh, I saw Spong probably winning the round, edging it. Although if they gave it a 10 0 round, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, Overham did come back, he did pretty well. Uh, to finish out the round. Uh, Mike, I noticed, you know, the, the left hand low, I'm sorry, the right hand low is actually to block the knees. Okay, all three judges are giving a 10-9 to Tyrone Spong after the first round. As you see, Cor Hemmer's in the corner of Alistair. Spong seemingly doing everything right in the first round, adhering to a strict game plan developed by Rene Ruse, Harry Hooft and Ernesto Hoost in his corner. You could not be in more experienced hands. Indeed, in his fight against Ray Sefo in the final 16, Spong did mimic a much smaller Ernesto Hoost. Big hello to Ray Sefo, who is watching in Las Vegas. Second round of three. Jab there from Overeem and a right round kick. Overeem switching again. There's the biggest switch dancer in the sport is Overeem. And he takes the brunt of the beautiful front kick. The size of the biceps here on Overeem. They should have their own zip code. Inside fire kick from Spong. Overhand right from Spong. He's got to be careful not to drop that right hand, or Alistair will catch him with the hook. Good scoop of the round kick there, Muay Thai style from Spong. He's also wearing a Thai Pride on his right bicep is Spong. With a double handed again. Spong switching to South Paul momentarily. Now back to his orthodox stance. And there's the left hook. Alistair didn't throw it with power. Almost just warning Spong, saying, hey, if you're going to drop it, I'm going to take it. Inside thigh kick from the ring. Outside thigh kick from the ring. That'll score for him. Spong not moving as much as he did in the first round. Standing a little more toe-to-toe -to -toe here with Alistair. Well, I think he's doing that because he's trying to bait Alistair to do the double clinch, the double fist clinch, so he can get that point. Overhand right from Tyrone. Alistair with the left hook, and there's the knee to the jawline, trying to land the good night, Irene. Switches to South Paul again, does the ring. Overhand right from Tyrone. And nice tight guard there from Spong on the inside. Oh, slams the leg kick to the inside thigh. Spong backing up the rim here. Yeah, Spong is dictating the, the, the ring movement here for sure, but he needs to go back to the body. He, he was very successful in the first round with the body assault. Alistair with an uppercut. Went so high, I heard organs playing. There's the high knee from the ring. And a double-handed clinch again. He keeps double-handed clinching him. The referee's just not seeing it. No, the referee's seeing it. He's looking, he wants to step in. I've seen him twice step oh, in. Right hand left hook from the ring. I told you Tyrone is dropping that right hand. He's got to stay mobile. High knee again from Alistair. Tyrone has slowed down here. This is dangerous final 18 seconds of the round for Tyrone. Tyrone Spawn has never carried this much weight. The heaviest he has ever been is just on the brink of 100 kilos. Two rounds down, one remaining as the Ream and Spong go to their corners. King Mo Lawal, your thoughts after two. I think, you know, uh, earlier, Spong was winning that round, but I think maybe Alistar could have stole, stole that round with the um, second half, you know, action. But um, it's, still, it's still close. Mike, what was Tyrone doing incorrectly, do you feel, in the second round? Well, I mean, who am I to judge what 
what somebody like Tyrone does incorrectly, but to me, I think he needs to go back to the body and be a lot more mobile. He is very stationary. He just stands in front of Alistair. That is one thing you do not want to do. Okay, two judges giving it to Alistair over him, one judge giving it a draw. So after two rounds, one judge has spawned ahead by a point, the other two have it a draw. So if we were to go to the decision right now, it would be a drawn fight. And it's still anyone's for the taking, for the right to fight in semi-final number two against Gokan Saki. Third and final round, and Tyron Spong opens up with the heavy artillery. Body shot there from Tyrone. You can hear him grunting behind every salvo now, the king of the ring. Good inside leg kick from Alistair. Over him. Trying to get on the inside to land the Ubani. Not working for him at the moment, though. Spong flat-footed again as he was for most of the second round and dropping that right hand dangerously. Alistair's punching output has increased as the rounds are progressing, uh, and that's going to favor him here in this round. Really, Tyrone really needs to either start moving more and throwing some leg kicks or really increase his punching output. Oh, nicely done by Spong. Took two backward steps and then slipped the jab in. Good head movement there from Spong, and he rips away to the liver section again. Heine! Good round kick to the right side of the carcass from Alistair and the uppercut. Now the power salvos from the rain. Spong's got to get off the ropes here! He's got to get off the ropes here! Alistair's going to tee off at him like a golf course! The uppercut! Spong's got to get back to centre ring! This is Alistair's territory! This, never... this is where Alistair's dangerous! Spong's on rubber legs! Here comes the rain! Standing count! Spong was caught against the ropes! And he is dazed! That left eye is almost swollen shut! The ring! Can Alistair finish now? Spong in a bad way here. That eye almost swollen shut. He's not going to be able to see the power right hand as much here of Overeem. Yeah, Alistair's smelling blood now, and he's going to try to go for a finish, and he's got the entire 55 seconds to do it. Overhand right! Spong taking punishment now. And he's still standing. He's still fighting. He will not go quietly into the night, Tyrone Spong. But he's got to get out of that corner. You wonder what more Spong has left here. Uppercut from Alistair. Tries to put the chin through the top of the head. Another uppercut. Almost took out a low-flying aircraft. 15 seconds remaining. Spong now with a Muay Thai clinch, but didn't work for him. It'll be Alistair's round at 10 8 up. It'll put him over the top here. Spong got caught against the ropes, and Alistair effectively put the count on him. King Mo will see the ream go through to the semifinals here. Yeah, he'll go to the semifinals. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the way he fought, you know, he started off kind of rough, but he picked it up, and uh, Gokasaki has his hands full. Mike, as we have a look again at Tyrone Spong getting caught against the ropes. As Alistair cut off the ring, you do not want to be there against the ring. No, you don't. And you know what? Alistair actually switched up his game for this fight. He was a lot more aggressive, a lot more coming forward. He was actually initiating uh, some of the uh, some of the offense, uh, offense himself, which is un not really his style been so far. You know, it's very impressive. I mean, he's, you know, he's won this fight, uh, I think, uh, you know, pretty decisively here in the last round. First chance for Overeem. There it is. But I tell you what, folks. Tyrone Spong, a little sportsmanship now. He has earned the respect of 
of all and sundry here at the Ariake Coliseum and surely the millions watching live around the world because Tyrone Spong is a warrior. Man, you get to see, you know, a guy that came up from 76 kilos that's uh, holding his own with uh, top, heavy, top heavyweights or super heavyweights in the world, you know, you know uh, it, shows, it shows a level of skill and athleticism. Alistair Overeem is through completing the quarterfinals. It will be Ertz versus Schultz and Saki versus Overeem. Please exit the ring. Thank you. Look at the crowd on hand here at the Ariake Coliseum. We are sold out. Folks, coming up next, the retirement fight of Yosuke Fujimoto against Esti Churches. Welcome back to the Ariake Coliseum in Tokyo. The Fields K1 World Grand Prix is alive and happening. As our semi-finals are set, Peter Ertz versus Semi Schultz. Alistair Overeem versus Gokan Saki. A sellout crowd here in Tokyo for the Super Bowl of striking, the Wimbledon of warfare, the 18th annual K1 World Grand Prix. What a night we have seen so far. And we're about to have a super fight as Yusuke Fujimoto in his retirement match takes on the destructive powers of the Egyptian trained by Tom Herring out of Team Chukariki. Stablemate of Peter Ertz and Murad Bazidi. And talking about Hesti Churches. Well, <laughs> ただ、もう僕もファンの戦える選手になると思ってなかったんで、本当に僕の周りもびっくりしてますし、親もやっぱり思うようにするんでそういう選手 そして決意の時10年間の思いを胸に最後の戦いへ。こういう形で引退試合をしていただけることに本当に。感謝しております。どんな相手でもいい。どんな強い相手でもいい。え、試合をさせていただきたいと思い。SD I'm 
負けてたとしても、とりあえず僕の精一杯の力を相手につけてやって、あ強いなと思わせてあげたいし、僕は負けるとも思ってないし、絶対勝って、KO したいなと思っています。はい SD カラケスバーサス藤本雄介ただいまよりフィールズ K1 ワールドグランプリ2 0 0 0ファイナルスーパーファイト藤本雄介引退試合を行います文文丸の最後の勇姿を見よブルーゲートより藤本祐介選手の入場です It's been a while since I've heard this entrance music The man from Bun Bun Maru, Yosuke Fujimoto, who comes out of retirement tonight to fight in his retirement fight. It's a little strange, but nonetheless, a final farewell for Fujimoto. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you. So he last fought in 2008 and lost to Evan Teixeira. Comes back here tonight after a two and a half year layoff for his retirement fight. His heyday was in 2007. He won the K1 Asian Grand Prix. He also challenged Bada Hari for the K1 World Heavyweight title, getting knocked out by a Hari head kick in Honolulu. He won the K1 World Grand Prix 2006 in Seoul. So there was a time when Fujimoto was considered the number one heavyweight in Japan, just ahead of Musashi. Those days are long gone, but Fujimoto has always been renowned as having a huge warrior's heart, if not the greatest of technique. And the Bumbun Maru steps through the ropes. I don't know what Bun Bun Maru means, but I like saying it. Red Gate Eli, Pesli Karate Senshi's Nijou. The WCFA Super Heavyweight Champion, he won that title in Amsterdam in 2009 with a decision over Ruslan Karayev. He won the It's Showtime title earlier this year against Bada Hari after Hari was disqualified for kicking churches when he was down. He lost to Semi Schultz in the final 16 in Seoul, a fight that many fans thought that Hezi was hard done by. gone seven and two in his last nine including wins over Paul Slowinski, Ashwin Balrak and Rustemi Krishnik in Amsterdam beating Krishnik with low kicks and the low kicks are the most potent weapon of Hesley Georges a man who has been touted by many as possibly a future K1 champion and with sparring partners like Peter Ertz like Murad Buzidi like Daniel Gita like Jerome Labana, Sir 
utterly. Churches at 26 is in the right hands. He hurdles the top ropes and is ready to send Fujimoto into retirement. Fujimoto! Hesdy Jerjes, who has the words no fear tattooed across his midsection, certainly showed no fear and no respect the way he tenderized the legs of Semi Schult over in Seoul at the final 16. Fujimoto has got to be asking himself, how the hell did I find myself in this situation where I come out of retirement to be retired against a man who is seriously looking to put some heavy punishment on me? I mean, he said it yesterday, Kingmo at the press conference, did Georges, that he wants to send Fujimoto into retirement in the most painful way possible. Well, he gets a chance to do it right now. Let's see. Look out for the leg kicks here on Jerjes, Michael Chevello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lowell with you. Jerjes who towers over Fujimoto. Fujimoto at 5'10, Jerjes at 6'7. 220 pounds, Jerjes, 217 for Fujimoto. Fujimoto, who is 35 years old. And you see there what I spoke about earlier on, never been a big technician, but full of power and a lot of heart, Fujimoto. He will throw down to the very end. As he cops a bit of a kick up the clucker, an enema from Hesty Churches. Churches with a very nice boxing guard. Looks through the brow, the chin tucks, the gloves around the temple and jawline. Fujimoto on the inside gets dropped here early. Nobody expects this one to go the distance. Most pundits thought it'll be over in the first round. We are under the three knockdown rule, under super fight rules here. That's one knockdown already. That's two knockdowns. One more and it's over. This was always going to be a slaughter just waiting to happen, Mike. Yeah, and unfortunately uh, for our tournament fighters, you know, they were probably hoping for a long, drawn-out war. But, you know, Hesney said, I'm going to give him a retirement he'll never forget. And looks it's like over. he just retired. It is farewell to Fujimoto. And for Hesney Churches, mark my words, folks. You are going to see his name again and again in 2011. And I'll bet early that he'll be in the final eight next year, Hesley Churches. Kimo, your first time seeing Hesley live. I know he didn't get to showcase a lot for us, but you also watched that fight on HDNet against Semi Schultz in the final 16. He has one to keep an eye on. Yeah, man. Uh, vicious, vicious, man. Those leg kicks, you know, um, he said get, um, goodbye to uh, Fujimoto, but you can say goodbye to Fujimoto's ACL as well, because that's gone. <laughs> The overhand right there from Hesdy Churches, the powerful Egyptian. And Bun Bun Maru, which I say for the final time. Let me get one more in there, Mike. Bun Bun Maru. If Fujimoto's upper body, just put a shirt on that man. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but goddamn. Put a shirt on that man. That's your body double. Program. I don't want to see that. <laughs> I don't want to see that. Great Sorry. sportsmanship there as Hesdy says farewell to Yosuke Fujimoto. He was a gallant warrior during his day, folks. 2007 Asian Grand Prix champion, 2006 champion in Seoul, 2005 finalist in Hawaii, 2003 finalist in the Japanese Grand Prix, the Monster Challenge heavyweight champion, wins over Musashi, over Shihok Chan, over Bobby Olongan, Minsu Kim, Mitsuyoshi Nakasako. Back in the day, he was a force on the Asian scene.
And he has just heralded a man who will be a force for the next few years to come. Next up, semi-final number one. Ertz versus Schultz. Welcome back to the Ariake Coliseum in Tokyo, where they are saying goodbye to Yasuke Fujimoto, his wife and child in Sukarin. And the Japanese fans seeing off a man who long served K1. Fought at the highest level, always with the biggest of hearts. I was thinking about it before the match. First off, please let me say this. To receive such a memento of my retirement, for you all to have prepared this for me, to FEG, to K1, and to all of the sponsors, to all the big companies that sponsored K1, and to all the fans, to all the fans of mixed martial arts, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I started karate when I was 20, and without much experience, I started K1 at 25. I thought K1 was all about winning or losing, and it seemed like a lot of fun to me, so I practiced hard. Starting with my first bout at Seido Kaikan, I met up with a lot of talented fighters and trainers, and sparred with a lot of great fighters, went to the States to learn boxing, and at one point retired. All of my experiences leading up to this moment, all of the fights I have, have turned me into the man I am today. Thanks to the support of so many people out there, I was able to do well. Unfortunately, I lost my last fight. But I did the best I could. And I think I was able to show myself to the fullest, and I'm very happy for that. To all the fans, to all the sponsors who have supported and cheered for me over the years, thank you very much. And of course, my greatest supporters, my parents, who supported me with my dream to join K1 and supported me strongly for the past 14 years, thank you very much. And of course, to my beautiful wife and daughter who has supported me, thank you very much. And to all the K1 fighters that I have fought and bonded with over the years, thank you very much. My 15 years in K1 were filled with a lot of pain, a lot of losses. But I believe I experienced something that most people don't have the luck to experience. And therefore, I will continue on with the rest of my life. And I ask you for your continued support. Thank you very much. Finally, to all the K1 fighters out there, the strong guys, the young guys, I will now become an MMA fan and do continue to support you. Thank you all very much. Exits a K1 ring in a moment for the final time. Fujimoto.
Thank you for showing us your brave fights for many years. An emotional moment indeed for Fujimoto. And the fighters, meanwhile, the four remaining fighters in the K1 Grand Prix must be allocated a certain amount of time for recuperation between bouts. Which, if you're wondering for the reasoning of putting this fight at this particular moment, there is a certain requirement in this eight man tournament for a recuperation period. With Fujimoto's retirement over. We now await the semi-final round. As he passes in front of our commentary position, Fujimoto. He heads backstage where Peter Ortz and Simi Schultz are ready to step into the ring for the fifth time. One of the greatest rivalries in K1 history is about to go down yet again. A sellout crowd here at the Ariaki Coliseum. As once again you see the brackets, Peter Ertz with a knockout of Mighty Mo. Semi Schultz, a decision over Kyotaro. Gokan Saki over Daniel Gita. And the Ream over Tyrone Spong. Here we go! In the semi finals, four men remain. One will emerge as the King of Kings. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our semi final fight number one. Making his way to the ring from the blue gate, let's welcome High Tower Sammy Shield. That music has become the most dreaded sound in all of K1 since 2005. There he is. Semi Schultz stomps his way to the ring yet again for the K1 Grand Prix semi finals. The size of him. If he stands up too quickly, he gets a nosebleed. Six foot 11 of Semi Schultz. An imposing sight indeed. King Mo Lawal, Your Majesty. How does Semi Schultz defeat Ertz here? It's a simple game plan. Just do what he's been doing. Keep him at the end of his jab. Keep him at the end of his right knee. All he has to do is control the range and the pace of the fight. He has this. Semi Schultz in his gi and his black belt hurdles the top ropes. Gives a salute and he is ready. And now making his way to the ring from the red gate. Let's welcome Peter. The Dutch Lumberjack, R. Yes! Mr. K-1 makes his way to the ring yet again! King Mo, you're a huge fight fan, brother, but how about this atmosphere? There is nothing like it! It's gonna get the hairs of your goatee standing on end! Hey, 
and feel like I'm in a stag electricity room, man. This is amazing. This is see this guy, you know, fight Timmy Shilt. Man, this is this off the chain right here, man. I'm ready, I'm ready. Look at this crowd at the Ariaki Coliseum! The Dutch Lumber Jack, Mr. K1 in the house! Mikey, I may very well burst a blood vessel on this one proper. I mean, the transformation Peter Arch goes from the laughing, loving, you know, let's hug him Peter Arch to this absolute animal is phenomenal. I mean, Peter's running the whole time to the ring watching like he's semi still there. Listen to that ovation! Final 16 in Seoul in 2008. An epic performance from Ertz to keep Schultz out of the Grand Prix. Before that, 2007, Schultz won via knockout. Before that, 2006, in the K1 Grand Prix Finals, Schultz won via decision. And the first time they fought in Auckland, New Zealand, 2006, it was Ertz who beat Schultz by decision. For the right to fight in the final, between them, they have won yeah! seven Grand yeah! Prix crowns. Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan, King Oloa. Ertz comes out leg slinging. Left hook from Ertz. He's going to get in Schultz's face like he did two years ago. Simi throws the right hand. And Peter Ertz opening up aggressively here, King Mo. Hey, these boys are banging. These boys are throwing down. This is, what, this is what everybody wants to see. P Peter Arch has the formula to beat Semi Shield. Semi Shield has the formula to beat Peter Arch, both experienced fighters. So all it comes down to is who can impose their will. I have never seen someone go to the jawline of Semi like Peter Arch has in the past. And he goes there again. Smack back on the kisser and the outside thigh kick. And he gets out of dodge. The old man has still got some fancy footwork. Stiff jab from Semi. Peter Ertz, who won the K1 Grand Prix in record time in 1998. Six minutes and 43 seconds until Semi Schultz shattered the record last year, winning in five minutes 52. Overhand run, left hook! Ertz is scoring! Get munching knee! And Schultz plows forward. That one reaching track. Ertz covers up, goes turtle shell. Look at the conditioning here on Ertz. Overhand right by Simeon Ertz rallies back. Toe to toe here in the first round. Right hand backs up Ertz. Ertz goes for the decapitator, the headache maker. Heine! Ertz has got to get out of the corner. He's got to get out of there. And he does. Simi let him off there. Peter looks in a phenomenal, phenomenal shape. And there he goes to the body, which is what Kyotaro should have been doing. Will Ertz be the one to stop Simi Schultz? Simi on the front foot now. Ertz came in plus 600 to win the tournament. Schultz at minus 135. Ertz changing levels. Jawline and Sterner. Checks the low kick to Simi. Ertz consistently trying to get to the inside here. Semi with a high knee. You know, the bigger question is, can Peter keep this pace up for the next three rounds, or, or the next two rounds, so to speak? High left round kick from Semi. He's jabbing, he's jabbing. Inside thigh kick from Peter. Now Semi on the front foot again, fires that tip, kick to the midsection, looks for the liver, and stalks forward. 
He'll try and go Klepto and steal the round. Glancing right hand from the Dutch Lumberjack. Oh. End of the first round, we go to the towers. Your Highness, King Mo, how did you see it? Man, I call it an even round. You know, I want to see more of this. But I, I think that if Peter Arts gets uh, Semi backing up, he'll, he can win rounds. Um, I love Peter. I really do. But I think Sammy took this fight, took this round. Peter looked active. Sammy looked a lot more accurate in this one. I think he really put it on in this round. And we'll go into the open scoring system in just a moment. The three judges' scorecards will flash up here. And as two rounds, uh, two judges give a draw, one round gives it away of Semi Schultz. So it's still close after one. 10 10, 10 10, 10 9. Second round. Wherever you're watching us live around the world, particularly our. Viewers in North America and HDNet, we hope you enjoy all the action. This is semi-final number one of the Fields K1 World Grand Prix, the Super Bowl of striking. It's a game, plows down the center corridor. Outside leg kick and semi returns the favor. It's trying for that tie technique. A little pit pat inside thigh kick off the left leg and then immediately come through the straight right hand. That was a cool kick to the back leg from Ertz. And then he goes with a switch up the front leg. Overhand right from Ertz. And Simi catches him with two clean punches. And Ertz offers his draw. I don't see that offered from Peter Ertz offering a free shot at his draw line. Peter's fired up. Peter is angry for this fight. Free, just cautioning Simi. Ertz is the sentimental favourite for the Grand Prix. He has been in every Grand Prix except last year's edition. This is his 17th appearance in the world's greatest martial arts tournament. That is phenomenal. The man's been fighting professionally since about 1988. I remember him venturing to Australia when he was about 20 years old to corner Branko Sikatik when Branko fought Stan the Man Longanides. The doctor will check that. He caught a nasty knee from Peter uh, during a clinch. I mean, I'm sorry, from Sammy. Let's have a look here again. Right hand under the eye there of Peter Ertz. So the ringside physician goes to work on the... Right cheekbone of Mr. K1, and Semi Schulte is ready and raring to go, as he always seems to be. It's just okay here. That'll be like waving a red flag in front of the charging ball that is Semi Schulte. He's a nasty fighter, Schulte. He'd send the get well letter to a hypochondriac just for fun, and he'll go after that cut now. Every time Ertz lands, even a glancing shot, this yeah. crowd rallies. This audience, which is so uncharacteristic of a Japanese audience, you know, usually they're so quiet. I mean, Peter's got to get out of the corner here. You will see the taping around Semi's right shin it was cut in the fight against Hesty Churches. So too, the left shin is bandaged. Semi has been prone to cutting up both shins throughout his career. And Ertz is aware of that. He chomps to the legs, hoping Semi will try and check the kicks in. Maybe try and get a cut going on Semi's shins. 45 seconds to go here in the second. Ertz comes forward, goes head hunting, misses, and a nice counter left there from Semi. I think Peter's starting to get a little tired and is slowing down. He's allowing Semi to, to find his rhythm a little more. The technique not as tight here on Ertz. He comes forward and looks for the liver, then goes over the top of the right hand. Outside pike from Ertz. That'll all score for him. Body shot, left to the right hand! That scores! Hit Ertz, trying to steal the round as that right eye swells shot. Big leg kick, overhand right. Did he do it? Old man, I think the old man saw this round, and uh, I'm ready for the next round. 
Peter Ertz cannot be written off, Mike. Peter might have done it there towards the end. He really picked it up, but you know, once again, it just depends on what you're scoring. If the judges are just what, looking at a guy coming forward, Peter would probably take this round, but I think Sammy's been the more accurate of the two fighters in this round in delivering his damage. Um, you know, Peter is trying, but I think he's unable to completely overwhelm Sammy as he's done before. A drawn second round. 10 all on all three judges' cards. It is still dead even with one remaining. Mo, what does no, no, Ertz need to do now? And he needs to keep on um, being aggressive, avoid it, you know, slip the jab and try to counter with right hands. Right hands, left hook. Second In for the ninja. Sammy Schultz corner and from our commentary position, no, Paul Hemmers, no. Ramon Decker, Bas Boone. And listen to the crowd. The war cries again for Mr. K1. The lumberjack comes forward. His face swollen and cut and bruised, but he still comes forward and scores. He goes head hunting with another hook. He's had more hooks hey. than a pirate's convention. And Simi Schultz has got to start to find range with a jab here, Mike. Yeah. Peter starts out strong in, in the beginning of the round. Hey. He's just got to find a way to keep that momentum throughout the entire round. That's how he won in Korea two years ago. You know, he overwhelmed Sammy, but when he backs away, it gives Sammy that chance to... Oh, do you see the kill to right hand? The gut punch in me! Ertz is scoring in this round! Sammy hey. clinching, can't get the knees off on the inside. Hey. Fantastic rally here from Peter Ertz, and the referee warns, do not hug. Official caution. Peter's just got to keep up that momentum that he's just generated. He's trying to steal this round. He steals this round, he wins this fight. Ertz with a wild left hook outside, Kike, that scores for him. So to the body shot, and again, Simi ties him up. He may incur the wrath of the referee if he's not careful, Simi Schultz. Big right hand! Peter Ertz says, made Simi Schultz lick the leather on several occasions here in the third. And Peter's doing a good job making him go backwards. That's the thing, that's the key. Make him go backwards and catch him with the right hand. Oh, that's it. Three right hands and a left hook! Semi Schultz wearing more leather than the Blue Oyster hey. Bar. This is Arts's round so far. This is Arts's round 100% hands down. And all he has to do is keep it up for another minute and he will win this fight. And we may see an Overeem Peter Arts final. Assuming, of course, he gets by Saki. But Peter is on fire here in this round. Can Peter Ars do it? Can he take Semi Schultz out of the Grand Prix? We have never seen Schultz eliminated from a Grand Prix. Ars goes to the liver, then goes to the head, then goes to the lead leg. Semi on the back foot. And Semi looks a little tired now. This is one tough old man right here. I'd hate to fight him. Semi's backing up. Peter goes to the body, and Semi clinches with him. Final stages. Oh, the right hand! The right hand! Semi shot through a quick out of his team. Peter Ertz on fire. Ertz is bringing the house down. Yes! Yeah, this is exactly what Peter was doing in, in, in Korea. Amazing right here. This is amazing. That's all hard, baby. Peter Arch was dead tired after the second round. He had a choice. He could just come out and fight it, or he could come out and really dominate and take over this fight. And that's exactly what he did. Semi Schultz being scored on time and time again in that final round. The ferocity that is Mr. K1. 
brought the Ariaki Coliseum to its feet. And draw, says the first judge. to Everton to share, but I, I really don't want to see him in the finals here. I do believe, though, Semi did not get knocked out. He, he would come back. The, he would get the first call he back. He would get the first call, you're right. Folks, coming up next, Goku and Saki versus the Ream. to the ring first from the blue gate, Alistair the Reem Ofri.
a monstrosity that is the Ream. Struts his way to the ring. Look at the scenes here at the Ariarchy Coliseum. We have seen history in the making. Peter Ertz eliminating Simi Schultz. He will now take on either the Ream or Saki in the final. The Ream looks happy to be here, Mike. But look how much at ease he is now coming in here for his second fight. You know, you could see he was visibly nervous before the Spawn fight. Now he's coming out here almost laughing uh, as he works his way in the semifinals. What's your take, Mo? Man, I'll tell you this. He looks ready. I think that he's very comfortable with the fact that he's fighting uh, um, you know, one of his teammates, Goku Saki. We probably studied, it, studied, you know what I'm saying, prior to this fight. There is a rumor that somebody at Golden Glory dropped Alistair over in his sparring. We're not sure who it is, but it was either Saki or Errol Zimmerman. You pontificate on that one. No offense to Errol, but I just, I don't see how that was happening. <laughs> and now let's go to the ring. Coming to us from the Red Gate, Kukan, the Rebel Saki. The massive entourage. The rebel Gokan Saki. He's got core hammers in his corner. In the corner of the ream, Roberto Flamingo and Martin De Jong. You've got to wonder how much of a toll the body shots from Daniel Gita took on Gokan Saki. Saki, the dark horse for the tournament. But now the smallest man remaining takes on the biggest. Overeem looking very relaxed, very confident, unscathed from his match with Tyrone Spong. Saki has speed. Saki has technique. Saki has heart. Overeem has size. Overeem has power. Overeem has momentum on his side. What does Saki need to do here, Mike? Saki really needs to do exactly what he did against Daniel Gita, with the exception of don't stand in front of the ream and don't let him tee off on you. Get in, get out. Get in, get out. But other than that, he fought a perfect fight. Incredible scenes here at the Ariake Coliseum. No event in the world compares to the K-1 World Grand Prix. Saki here in the semi-finals. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting tonight out of the blue corner. He hails from Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alistair the Reem Ofrim. <laughs> And his opponent across the ring fighting tonight out of the red corner. He is a K-1 World Grand Prix 2008 USA Tournament Champion from Turkey. Here is Gukan, the Rebel Saki. Saki versus the Reign. Kebabs versus horse meat. In semi-final number two, for the right to take on Peter Ertz in the final. These two men know each other well. Stable mates at Golden Glory, but you can believe they're going to throw down hard here in the semi-final. Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan, and King Mo no! are with you. Saki's got to be fast. He's on the move already. Cannot stand in front of Overeem. 
Over him tries to close off the ring and goes for a high knee. And Saki looks for the headache maker. Saki's doing what he's supposed to. See, stick and move. Get to him and move. Don't stand, don't be a stagnant star, a target. Technically superb, Gokan Saki. And the ring just trying to shut him down here. Beautiful, left hook to the jawline, then to the liver. Right round kick from Saki. Cheap kick. He used it well against Gita to the thighs. Cheap kick to the midsection. Oh, rips to the liver. See it's how he attacks on the move? Every time he moves and then he attacks, he's fighting a perfect fight so far. He's got to get off the ropes, though. And he's circling nicely. Good uppercut there from Saki. He's beating Alistair to the punch. It's the speed at the moment and the accuracy from Gokan Saki. Alistair trying to set the left hand here. But Saki is changing angles. Look at the repetitive strikes off the lead glove from Saki. Overeem just keeps coming forward like a juggernaut. Jab and a rip kick that one hurt Saki. Oh, he felt that one. I told you the body has been damaged after the Gita fight. It may be the chink of the armor. He tries for another spinning hook kick. He's, he's keeping his right hand inactive because it's blocking that rib. That rib is gone. He hasn't used his right hand yet. Alistair knows it. And the thing I like about Alistair, he's a patient fighter. He doesn't throw willy-nilly. He doesn't just throw haymakers. Everything throws to hit with a force of will. And now Alistair knows exactly where the target is. And that's the right side rib cage. Alistair switches. Saki is hurt. First count of the round. One more count and it's all over. And Alistair just relaxed. Glances towards his corner. Roberto Flamingo barking instructions, but it's over. Yeah, that arm is broken. That, I mean, yeah, props to Gokasaki, but he was in so much pain, it was too obvious that there's something wrong with the right side. I mean, you can just only hide it for so long. But... Alistair over him. Cements himself a spot in the K1 final. A dream matchup with Peter Ernst. But King Mo, what an effort tonight from Gokan Saki. Gokan Saki came, you know, he tried to set, you know, it was like, like, uh, Speedy Gonzalez versus the best of the cat, and he finally got caught, you know what I'm saying, like the, like the cat does the mouse with the leg kicks the body, and it was over with from there. Alistair Overeem looking very fresh here, Mike, which is a scary, scary thought for Peter Ernst. A, a huge, huge props to Alistair Overeem. I mean, in his only second year in K1, and, uh, you know, he goes to the finals. I'm sorry, that looked like a knockdown. I mean, he was in perfect balance. His hands were up, and he ends up on his butt. I'd say there was a knockdown. But anyway, that aside, uh, you know, props to Alistair, but I was very impressed with Gokan Saki's performance. I would love to see these two rematch where Gokan Saki is at 100%. Alistair Overeem on the steps in front of our commentary position. Look at the beautiful kick. That was the end for Gokan Saki. That right side of the carcass was banged up by Daniel Gita, as I mentioned earlier on. Overeem wisely saw it and wisely exploited it. Yeah, that was very impressive. Very impressive. And you know, I'd like to give a shout out to some of my people out there that you know that watch this fight. You know, Take uh, it away. Bull, Bloodstain Lane, Mike Hackler, Peanut, Forrest, Daywalker, Ace, Catfish, Jason High, Team Thirsty, Percy Crawford, MMA Junkies, and my Ryan Parsons, and Mayhem Miller. And here's how the brackets panned out, folks. Peter Hurts defeating Marty Mo, defeating Simi Schultz, making the final. Alistair Overeem over Tyrone Spong and over Gokan Saki. Old versus new. Took the flash in the final. Raymond now, the manager of so many fighters in Holland, including Giorgio Petrosi and Tyrone Spong. And Saki receiving tributes from all and sundry here.
as well he should. And what a worry am I. Oh, phenomenal. I mean, my God. You know what, Saki? You don't have to have your hand raised to be a champion. This man showed a lot of heart, showed a lot of technique. Props to him. Every year he keeps improving. Every year he's getting better. Keep preaching. Unbelievable. You know what, while we're doing shout outs, let's not forget our brother Ray Seffo, who's sitting in Las Vegas watching us on HDNet. Folks, it is time for the halftime show here at the K1 World Grand Prix. We're about to see Momoyuno Clover, otherwise known as Momo Clover, the hottest girl group in all of Japan, about to take the stage.
Tomohiro Clover, the hottest girl band in Japan. Okay, let's get on with business, folks. There is still a lot more to come here at the K1 World Grand Prix. The final is set. The Ream versus Mr. K1, and King Mo does not get any more exciting than that. Old guard versus new. Well, I'm going to say like this. Hide your kids, hide your wife. Super new is made to the finals. Mike, the odds have just been released for the final. It is over him at minus 450. Ertz at plus 350. Folks, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll return with the business end of the Fields K1 World Grand Prix. We'll be right back with more HDNet Presents K1 World Grand Prix 2010 Final. Coliseum in Tokyo, Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan and His Royal Highness King Mo Lawal, where the final has been set. Peter Ertz versus Alistair Overeem has Epic written all over it. King Mo, Peter Ertz, the old man, still has what it takes to reach the K1 final again in his 17th World Grand Prix, but can he beat the Ream? Well, he's going to have his hands full with this one because he had two, you know, not, not he had one tough battle with Semi, and I think he might have took it out of him, you know, and uh, Alistair, you know, uh, just kind of just did his thing, man, made it to the finals, and uh, I think he's going to win this. Alistair had it easy in the end against Gokan Saki. Mike, who was injured after the Daniel Gita fight earlier on. So will it be easy pickings for the Ream over Ertz? Maybe. You know, uh, Peter's definitely banged up. You know, I think his eyes are concerned. He might, he might not even be able to make it to the finals. But assuming he's in the finals, you know, uh, Peter's got his hands full for sure. I mean, they fought the last time. It was a total annihilation. I mean, Alistair just destroyed Peter Ertz completely. But Peter is super motivated. And, hey, who picked him to be in the finals? Hey, who picked them to be in the finals? Oh, that would be someone named Mike Kogan. Good call there, Mikey. And Nick Kalikas from BetOnFighting.com has released the odds for the finals yet again. If you're a betting person, you'll get minus 450 on the ream. He goes in as the favorite. You'll get plus 350 on Peter Ertz. He goes in as the underdog. It is all happening here at the Ariaki Coliseum in what has been an epic night as only the Super Bowl of stand-up. The Wimbledon of Warfare, the K1 World Grand Prix can do. We have seen so much action so far here tonight. Let's take you back through a recap of the night's action thus far. Then we'll return with the main portion of tonight's main show. Thank you. 
Welcome back as HDNet presents K1 World Grand Prix 2010 Final. Welcome back to the Ariake Coliseum in Tokyo. The 18th annual K1 World Grand Prix has been alive and happening. And rumors do abound. Peter Ertz suffering a bad injury, a cut under his eye in his epic semi-final victory over Semi Schultz. Word backstage is, however, that Peter is still in at this stage. We have not heard that he is out. Peter is indeed still in the final to showdown against Alistair Overeem, which is a great thing, Mikey, because he brought the house down and he gave renewed hope here. After so many people had hoped that someone would take out Semi Schultz, it was the man, Peter Roots, who did it. As he did in the final 16 two years ago, and he got standing ovation from both the fans and the fighters back then. Peter's got an emotional momentum going his way. I think, you know, he had a very emotional victory against uh, Sammy Shield. He's in the finals for the fourth, you know, he has a chance to become the four-time champion. However, Alistair has just looked unstoppable so far and had relatively, what, it's, it's really an understatement, a relatively easy semifinal. We do also want to say, speaking to Gokan Saki backstage during the intermission, he has broken his right elbow and his right hand. So that was the problem there. King Mo, a terrible injury for Gokan Saki that will no doubt keep him sidelined for quite a while. Yeah, man. You know, uh, he, I think uh, Gita weakened all that up, and uh, Alistar just finished it. You know, uh, tough, tough. You know, it's a tough one for Gokan Saki, but he showed the heart of a true champion. So now we see Alistair Overeem to take on Peter Ertz in the final. I guess for many, it was an unexpected final, not for Mike Hogan, of course. He tipped that Peter would be in the final match. But we come to a clash of styles here, guys, because you've got Peter Ertz with those big lumbering leg kicks, those wild hands, always an in-your-face fighter. Against Alistair Overeem, with that beautiful double forearms defense, a very patient Overeem who loves to hunt opponents down, press them against the ropes, cut off the ring, push them into a corner like he did to Tyrone Spong and unload on them. So, Mo, how do you see this one playing out? Well, uh, 
I don't think Arts is Alistar's kryptonite. I think Alistar's gonna go through, you know, use his athleticism, use his physicalness, use his size, and, and just get him out of there. First round KO. Okay, and Mike, we've seen the injury to Peter Ertz. It was serious enough that there was some debate backstage that maybe Ertz was going to be out and Semi Shook was going to replace him. That is not the case, though, folks. Do not worry. Peter Ertz will show down against Overeem in the final. Can Ertz beat the Reem, though? It would take an almost Superman effort to beat the Reem in the final. I mean, it would really take some serious Superman efforts because Peter Arch's style actually plays into Alistair's style. Peter Arch is very active, but Alistair can take his punches and can take his kicks, but he can also counter them as he did in their first fight. I mean, he just completely annihilated Peter. Peter also now has a handicap where he has to worry about his eye. And, you know, Overeem is a fighter. He's going to see a, a, a chance to capitalize on an injury. He's going to go after it. I see that going Overeem's way. Last time these two men met, Overeem was the winner over Ertz here. Broke Ertz's rib cage with the knee in the first round. But Ertz valiantly oh, fought you. on only to lose okay. by a decision to the Reem. So Alistair will try and go to the inside again, no doubt, Mike, and go to work on the rib cage, go to work on the uber knee to the jawline. But more importantly, the nasty fighter Overeem is, he will go to town on that busted up eye. Absolutely. And you know what? Nasty or not, that's what fighters do. If you see a cut, if you see an opportunity to capitalize on something and end the fight early, why not take it? You know, props to Overeem. I mean, we are talking about a guy, his second year in K1, and he's in the World GP Finals. You know, I give him all the credit in the world. Hey, I didn't pick him to come this far, but that doesn't take away from his skills or his abilities to be here in the finals. Overeem goes into the final as the favorite with the bookmakers. At the start of the night, semi Short was the favorite at minus 135. He is out at the hands and legs of Peter Ertz. The Reem, you would have gotten plus 205 with him at the start of the night. You would have got plus 600 with Peter Ertz at the start of the night. But as I said, the Reem is now the favorite to take the crown. Mo, once again, your first time here at the K1 World Grand Prix. We were talking just backstage during intermission. You've loved every moment of this. We always tell you, nothing compares to the Grand Prix. You've seen it firsthand here now. Hey, nothing compares to this. I was the Pacquiao fight. I've been at football games, basketball games, the UFCs, the strike force, strike force events. This tops everything. This is the best thing going right now. Well, folks. The lights are about to go down again, and we will get ready. Two matches remaining. Karatanov and Sigha JT, and then the big one, the Reem versus Mr. K1. This is the first time そう、そう、先に進んで行きたいなって。インドまで足立区育ち。新宮ハート参加最年少にしてトーナメント制覇。アジアの期待を背負い、世界へと大きな一歩を踏み出した<笑> Еще раз хочу сказать, что для меня это определенная цель. И в следующий год я ставлю на себя задачу, как и предыдущую, и предыдущему бою. Я должен быть в восьмерке сильнейшим. ヘビー級ファイター。拳一つで沈めてきたスーパーハードパンチャー。かつてシルトやアリスターでさえ彼の拳の前に立ち続けることはできなかった。打撃テクニックにさらなる磨きをかけ、K1 
疑惑はないなやっぱボクシングはうまいんでもうまだでも K1 にな,な,な,なりきれてないっていうか慣れはまだしてないなっていうのはちょっとあるっすねやっぱ世界の星になるために絶対に落とせないこの戦いシングルハートジャディブ。Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our Fields K1 World Grand Prix 2010 Super Fight Number Two. Let's welcome first to the ring, coming to us from the Blue Gate, Sing Heart Jadi. But you've got to wonder how he will handle the power of Sergei Karatanov here tonight. JT Pura has not been embraced by non Japanese fans. The Japanese adore him. Japanese is his first language. But beyond Japan's borders, he's been received as a very lackluster fighter. An opportunity here for Singha JT to show himself in a different form to the K1 brass, that being an exciting form. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the ring, coming to us from the Red Gate, Sergei Kiritanov. Yes, he has. And by the way, for those of you wondering why every fighter coming out here is wearing a fight game sticker, patch, or t-shirt, it is a fight game. It is a game that will be available in the United States on the new Microsoft Windows 7 mobile devices starting this month. So those of you who have Microsoft mobile devices, uh, get your butts over to the market and look for the fight game. 
Sergei Karatanov, who was impressive against Takumi Sato and Sol. Can he chomp up the legs and drop some power hands for the jawline of the towering Sihat JD? Through the ropes goes Karatanov. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting tonight out of the blue corner. He stands 195 centimeters tall and weighed in at 108 kilograms. Here is the K1 World Grand Prix 2009 Asia Champion from India. Here is Singh Hart Jaji. And his opponent across the ring fighting tonight out of the red corner. He stands 194 centimeters tall and weighed in at 116 kilograms. Coming to us from Russia, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sergei Haritanov. <laughs> Sergei Haritanov at minus 105. Singha JD at minus 125. Karatanov, who stands at six foot four, JD at six foot five, officially listed though. Having seen them here together and seen them together yesterday, JD is at least a couple of inches taller than Karatanov. Karatanov at 242 pounds, JD at 220 even. And we are set for three rounds with one extension in case of a draw. In our super fight, Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lawal with you. JT has good leg kicks and high knees. No power really in his hands. Karatanov will try and walk him down and put him against the ropes, put him in a corner and bomb away. Karatanov, part of the fabled Golden Glory gym. Nice liver shot there from Karatano, just tipping that left hand. Checks the leg kick. Shane Zeep moving a lot here in the first round as he needs to, Mark. Yeah, Haritanov has a very extensive boxing background. You know, back in Russia, he was in the special forces. He did, he did a lot of boxing training. His weakest point were the leg kicks. And, you know, as we've seen in the Sato fight, he's done a really good job in learning how to check him. So I'm very interested in seeing, you know, what happens here. But definitely, Singhat needs to move around as much as he can as, as Haritanov packs some serious punching power. Oh, Karatanov rips away to the body in a straight right hand smack bang on the kisser of the Indian. Shadeep cannot afford to let Karatanov find his rhythm here. Double head kick, nothing getting past the forearms though. Make it in triplicate there from Singha JD. Meanwhile, backstage, Peter Ertz is preparing himself for Alistair over him. Peter Ertz is injured. A cut under his eye, but you can bet that Tom Harrick is scripting up a game plan for him as we speak. Good little knee there on the inside from Singhart JD. Left hook, left jab. Oh, nice right hand from Karatanov. JD ties him up. This is an impressive showing so far from Sergei. Until that right hand caught him. Sergei stays buckled. Well, JT found some power and some accuracy, mode. Oh, for sure. I mean, Sergei Haritanov is on Queer Street. He's shooting for double legs, which is usually what MMA fighters do when they're when they're completely out. And seeing how JT is trying to capitalize it, it was that knee that landed that really did the damage. And there he goes again. Haritanov in danger here of being derailed by the towering Indian. See it. JT drops Karatana. Keep on. How about that? Ten, I'm eight, speechless, really. Um, I thought that uh, Karatana was going to run right through him, but obviously he's getting. And it's over. Work. Karatana Man. with a chicken dance. And it's going to go Wow. Wow. I said earlier that Singhat needed to impress the K1 grass, and he's done it. Mike, 
God, I mean, you want to talk about an upset of the night. Unfortunately, you know, this is a super fight, so nobody really cares, but my God. Well, no, Mike, I wouldn't say that, because this man is Bam is the who has committed himself to a K-1 career in 2011, and he gets dropped by the hands of Singha Chang Deep. Well, it's actually, embarrassing. But it, to his credit, it was, the, it was the knee that did the initial damage, and then from there on, you know, he was already on a quiz streak. But you know, a lot of it is also Haritano's inexperience in K1. Instead of just putting a high guard up and trying to ride out the round, you know, he continued to try to engage with Singhat, and that opened up for those punches. But yeah, definitely, uh, you know, not a good way to end the year for Haritano's uh, K1 aspirations. So, Karantano, who said yesterday his aim in 2011 was to make the final eight. Let me tell you, Sergei, that aim is very, very lofty indeed. If you're going to get dropped by the hands of Singha Jadeep. <laughs> We've seen many an impressive performance from mixed martial artists coming to K1. King Mo is a mixed martial artist yourself. That was not an impressive one there. Well, the takedown attempt was pretty impressive. <laughs> we shot a high crotch uh, to a double leg. Um, that was impressive, man. But, you know, Karatana will hit the, you know, hit the drum boy. Hopefully he bounces back. And he can learn from this. Singha Jadeep victorious. A good way to round out the year for the Indian fighter. And folks, coming up next, the moment we've all been waiting for. Peter Orts and the Ream. Welcome back to the Ariaki Coliseum in Tokyo, where we are set for the final of the K1 World Grand Prix, the 18th edition. Michael Chavello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lawal with you. King Mo, once again, your thoughts on the final. Old man Peter Ertz versus the rampaging Reem. Well, Peter Ertz has heart, but uh, I think that, you know, Overeem, AKA Super, <laughs> is gonna pull this one out. <laughs> Mike, are the odds just too highly stacked here against Peter Ertz? Just when you think you can ride out Peter Ertz, though, he accomplishes miracles. He always does, and you know, I don't want to be a party pooper and, and try to be anti-climatic, but this is really a tall order here. I mean, the two of them met before, uh, and Reem wasn't even as experienced as he is, I guess, now in his 11th K1 fight. Uh, and Reem just completely destroyed him. I mean, Peter didn't have anything for him. He's banged up, he's cut, he's injured, I mean, if he was to win, you know, I guess anything's possible. And Peter Ertz wins. He will equalize with semi Shilton and Ernesto Hustasay, four-time champion. Alistair Overeem, of course, looking for his first ever championship. Your Majesty, does Peter Ertz just go hell for leather, go for broke to the jawline of Overeem for the first 90 seconds and try and get a knockdown? Man, he's going to find some kryptonite somewhere, though. I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do. He comes forward. Um, being aggressive, he might get countered, need. If he sits back and lets um, over him take, pay, take over everything, then he get knocked out. So he's in a lose-lose situation, honestly, in my book. Mike, could the best game plan here of Alistair Overeem be to cover up with that Mamanaki. beautiful double forearm scar, ride out the storm, and wait Mamanaki. for Peter to blow himself He's out, which Peter is most likely to do. Well, that, but also, you know, Alistair's a very good counterpuncher, and Peter going after him hard would give him a chance to counterpunch and be able to start mounting his offense. If I'm in Peter's corner, and by God, he's got, you know, people that have way more experience than me, but if I'm in Peter's corner, I say, Peter, keep a high Remy Boyanski style guard, protect that eye, go after Alistair's body and his legs with leg kicks, circle, circle, take it into the later rounds. Okay, folks, it is coming up shortly. The K1 World Grand Prix final. Peter Ertz versus Alistair Overeem. If Ertz was to do it, Mike, as I said, if he was to accomplish a miracle, it would arguably be the most epic K1 final victory of all time. It will be the most epic combat sports victory of all time. It'll be a comeback from such behind that such behind does not exist. It would be just, it would just be... It was just unbelievable. It really would be. Mo, can you believe this? Your first time at a K1 Grand Prix, and you are seeing arguably the hottest fighter on the planet, Alistair Overeem, taking on the biggest legend in K1 history. Yeah, man, this is this is amazing. This uh, I'm speechless, really. Uh, but it's gonna be bad. I think it's gonna be bad in the finals. To be honest with you. Peter Ertz can never be ruled out, folks. He does accomplish the unthinkable. Nobody thought that he'd be able to stop Semi Schultz, except for Mike Kogan. 
But you were right, Mike, and he did it in style too. I mean, that third round of Peter Roos, just when the round you thought he may have slowed down, the round you may have written him off on, he came out like a house on fire and just had sacked the jaw of Semi without relent. Well, that was all hard. I mean, the first two rounds, you know, he was doing what he needed to do. He just needed a little more momentum, a little more aggression. And I'm sure in the third round, uh, you know, uh, Tom Hammerstein looked at him and said, if you want this fight, suck it up. Find it wherever it is. You go out there and, and you do it. And he did it. So, you know, if he can carry that momentum into the into this fight, I think it's still a tall order. Mike, you've also got to put in perspective just how great it is for Peter to reach this stage because earlier this year, he was getting knocked out by Kyotaro. Exactly. He was getting knocked out by Kyotaro. He was coming into this fight. Most people had him beating Mighty Mo and then going into the second uh, uh, fight with Sammy Shields and just completely getting annihilated. Here he is in the finals. I guess anything is possible. As I look up at the big screen here, they are showing backstage footage. Alistair Overeem looks ready and raring to go. And now they are cutting to some footage of Peter Ertz, who is ready to make his entrance. His visor is covering his face. We can't get a good look at the cut under the right eye at the moment of Peter Ertz. But both men are poised on the stage, about to enter the arena. And it looks like, Mike, we can see now they've really gone to town and done a good job on that cut under the eye, Peter Ertz. Coming into the fight, can that hold up? Like I said, keep a high guard, go after the body, go after the legs, tenderize Alistair, take him into the later rounds. And you see the look on the face there of Alistair over him. He looks like he is ready to eat a whole stable of horses. Oh, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, Alistair looked visibly concerned before the Spong fight. By the time he came out for the Saki fight, he was laughing. He was all over the place. As we see some highlights of how both men reach the finals. Peter Ertz knocking out Mighty Mo in their quarterfinal match. Alistair Overeem, who stepped up against a game Tyrone Spong, who really did serve it up to Overeem in the opening part of the fight. The Reem took a while to come out of the starting gate, King Mo, but once he got started, he turned it on, especially in the final round. Yeah. You know what? Uh, first round, he was pretty tentative. Um, Tyrone had his uh, timing down, had the range down. Second round, he put the pressure on, and I think Tyrone started to fade. And then uh, from then, it just went downhill for Tyrone. And the most amazing performance of the night so far, Peter Ertz defeating Simi Schultz with a fantastic third round. It was dead even after two. But Peter Ertz, that crazy old bastard, turned it up in the third, King Mo, and he wrote his name yet again into the history books. Man, that dude is a tough old man. He will not, it was like a Rocky story pretty much, and, and he was Rocky. <laughs> Gokan Saki proved to be easy pickings. He was banged up already from the match against Daniel Keita earlier in the night. The ring just hunted him down. Saki was brave, but he couldn't throw off his right side of the body. His elbow broken, his hand broken, and the ring quite easily just moving through to the final match. Folks, strap yourselves in. Here we go. The final of the K1 World Grand Prix. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our tournament final, and it is being brought to you by FEG. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the Ariake Coliseum here in Tokyo, Japan, this is our Fields K-1 World Grand Prix Final 2010 main event of the evening. Let's welcome to the ring first, coming to us from the Blue Gate, Alistair the Reem Ofrey.
What a moment here for the Reem Alistair Overeem. His first ever appearance in a K1 Grand Prix final. And he goes up against the man who's been in 17 tournaments. Overeem will come in as the favourite. Unscathed from two fights so far. Taking on a battle scarred Ertz. As the Reem stands next to our commentary position, he gets that crazy look in his eyes, King Mo. You know what? <laughs> I hate to fight him right now. Through the ropes goes the Reem. And we await the entrance of Mr. K1. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the ring, coming to us from the Red Gate, Peter, the Dutch Lumberjack R. Hugging, smiling guy to just a complete animal and a warrior when it comes to getting in the ring. He's just phenomenal. I mean, just look at his eyes. He's intense. He is focused. He is ready to go. He is the oldest competitor in this tournament. He is in the finals of the K1 World Grand Prix in 2010. Nobody gave him a chance, and here he is entering the ring. Ernst goes over the top rope. Could he possibly pull up a miracle? He stopped the shield. Can he stop the rain? Ladies and gentlemen, this bout is scheduled for three three-minute rounds. Introducing to you first to my right, fighting tonight out of the blue corner. He stands 195 centimeters tall and weighed in at 119 kilograms. Coming to us from Poland, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alistair Hurim Oldrey. And his opponent across the ring fighting tonight in this tournament final in the red corner. He stands 192 centimeters tall and weighed in at 107 kilograms. Here is the three-time K1 World Grand Prix champion from Holland, Peter the Dutch Lumberjack Ford. No denying who the crowd is behind here. A fantastic ovation for Peter Ertz. Look at the right eye here of Ertz. Tom Herring there by his side as he was when Ertz won in 94 and 95. Core Hemmers by the side of Alistair Overeem. Third man in the ring, the legendary Nobuaki Kakura. A rematch last time. It was Overeem who won after breaking Ertz's rib cage in the first. The words grinded it out to a decision. We now have Alistair Overeem minus 645. Ertz a plus 445. Yeah. Wow. Michael Cervello, Mike Kogan, King Mo Lawal, the final of the K1 World Grand Prix. Ertz goes head hunting early, as we thought he would. Alistair tries to force him against the ropes. Alistair starts aggressively. Big right hand from the ring. That's the most aggressive start we've seen from Alistair so far. Yeah, Alistair's not letting this fight. He's going to try to not let this get this fight out of the first round. He feels that Peter Ars is probably banged up, and this is really his time to capitalize on it. Overhand right from the ring. 
outside thigh kick from Ertz. And the ring trying to break those ribs again. A monstrous overing. Ertz has got to get up the corner here. It's good night, Irene! Alistair Irene is the K1 Grand Prix champion! Man. Unbelievable! Hey, listen, you gotta give this guy props. This time last year, he said, I'm gonna take K1 seriously and I'm gonna go to the top. And here is Alistair Overeem, an MMA fighter, has become a K1 World Grand Prix champion. I mean, what more can you say? The, the, the top, he's a top combat athlete, hands down, this year. Hands down. Unbelievable. You cannot deny the awesomeness of Alistair Overeem. He has proven himself yet again. He has now won the most coveted striking title in the world of martial arts. Unbelievable. The dedication training all year long, taking it as seriously as he can take. You can go to www.reem.com and see the documentary in, in his progress to get here. This man has really done it. He set his goal. Unbelievable. Hats off. We're not wearing any, but if we wear, hats off to Alistair. And for Alistair Overeem, to the victor go the spoils. But for Peter Ertz, the sentimental favorite is still the people's champion of K1. Because tonight, King Mo, he pulled off a victory that will be talked about for a long time to come, becoming the first man ever in history to eliminate Semi Schultz from a tournament. You know, this, this, this whole this whole tournament, man, you know, uh, has me speechless. You know, you, you got you have the guy that's the underdog, you have the guy that's the super, and you know, you know how it goes down, man. He just came out on top. Alistair Overeem on top of the world. Mixed martial arts world heavyweight champion and now the K1 world champion and the sportsmanship here in center ring. Alistair just hoisted Peter Ertz over his head. What a show of sportsmanship from the ring. He is a gentleman, Mike. Oh, absolutely. And you know, as the saying goes, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm like really good with sayings, but I saw further by standing on the shoulders of the Giants. And Peter Art, he's a giant of K1. You know, he is at the end of his career. He has proved everything there is to prove. He has shown everything there is to show. And yet here at age, whatever, what is he, 39, almost 40 years old, Peter Art is still setting records. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Alistair Overeem making history here tonight. The first time ever any fighter has held a mixed martial arts world title as well as the K1 Grand Prix title. Folks, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with more from the Ariake Coliseum. Welcome back to the Ariake Coliseum in Tokyo, where Alistair Overeem has been crowned the 18th World Grand Prix champion, the eighth man to ever win the title. And more than that, Mike, history in the making here tonight. As I said earlier, the first man ever to hold 
MMA World Title and K1 World Pro Championship. I mean, what a night. The night of upsets, the night of emotional fights, the night of surprises, the night of records being broken, history being made, all together happens. Every World GP brings something new to the history of combat sports, and this one was no different. Sammy Shield, first time in his career ever being upset out of a tournament. Peter Arts with an emotional win coming here into the finals. And of course, Alistair Overeem, the current Strike Force heavyweight champion, now becoming the K1 World Grand Prix champion. And King Mo Lawal, as you said, Alistair Overeem is the fighter on the planet right now. Yeah, hands down, the fighter on the planet. You know, he, he's beat, you know, he's the top, top three, top four of MMA, MMA, and then he's the top guy in kickboxing. It gets no better than that. He is the master, indeed. Alistair Overeem, seemingly unstoppable. The Reem. <laughs> Roberto <laughs> Flamingo, Martin <laughs> Dion. <laughs> Bas <Boone. laughs> And Peter Oates may not have won the title, but he won our hearts yet again. Tom Herring, Franco Sikatika there with Hertz. He went over the audience here in the Ariake Coliseum. I'm sure wherever you're watching our broadcast around the world, Mr. K1 captured your imagination. He did what nobody else could do, Mike, just like he did in Seoul two years ago in the final 16. He stopped Sammy Schultz. Most definitely. And you know, like I said, in Peter's time, his time has come. Um, you know, he's, he's dominated his time slot. Now he just takes it one battle at a time and still, yet he's able to create new records. And that is, you know, upsetting Sammy Shield, of course, and getting him out of this tournament, making it to the final. Hey, doing the best he can to put up a fight. Sammy Shield was a little exposed in the final 16 in Seoul by Hesty Churches. And again here tonight, Mike, did he show that he is on a downward slide now, no longer the unstoppable monster that he has been for the last five years. Maybe not quite as dominant as he was, uh, you know, uh, when he won his consecutive uh, titles, but I wouldn't really say downslope. You know, every fighter has a formula to be beaten. Otherwise, they would just be unbeaten for the rest of their life. It's just a matter of implementing that. Gokan Saki there, a broken right elbow and a broken right hand. But King Mo Lawal, another fighter here tonight, Gokan Saki, who captured our imaginations with that fantastic win over Daniel Gita. Man, you know, he's a small, one of the smallest guys here in the tournament, and he fought like a big man. He is, you know, he is the heart of a champ, and we'll see a lot of him in the future. A massive ovation for 40-year-old Mr. K1, Peter Ernst. Well deserved, thoroughly earned. Evident to Shira in the background there was impressive against Zimmerman. Tyrone Spong, how about him, Mike? That first round, you thought he almost had the ring. I mean, Tyrone Spong is probably, you know, I mean, in my book, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He just came up a little short. I think he's, you know, he's gotten heavier. He's got to get used to that weight. He, you know, if he spends all of 2011 getting used to being heavier and, and, and getting back his groove, you know, he'll be back stronger than ever. Every fighter here had a story. You know, Gokan Saki, phenomenal display of not only technique uh, and uh, speed, but also his un undeniable heart. You know, it's just, like I said, every fighter here has a story. We cannot deny Daniel Gita as well. What a moment for him making history. The first ever Romanian to qualify for the K1 World Grand Prix. And Mike, you wonder what may have been had he not been injured or carrying a sickness. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, what may have been. I'm more interested in what may have been if Gokan Saki's arm wasn't broken, because even with just one arm and, and, a, and, a, and a total injury, I mean, I think he was still taking it to Alistair. So there's many what-if serious. What if Tyrone Spong was better used, equipped to his weight, and was a little quicker on his feet? You know, what if Peter would have done something phenomenal? And that's why year after year after year, we tune into the World Grand Prix Final, and no matter who's fighting there, we'll always have the what-if that excites us into watching it. So many storylines unfold, and it's why the K1 World Grand Prix is number one for striking, number one for drama, number one for excitement. King Mo, once again, your first time here at the Grand Prix, and I bet you're gonna come back again next year. We'd love to have you because you've had the time of your life. I'll be here next year, and I'm looking forward to seeing Bader in the tournament too as well. The moment belongs to Alistair Overeem. The question indeed is who can stop the ream?
in K1 and in mixed martial arts. He hey. is literally Mike, the top dog. And you know what? Uh, we would be stealing his moment if right now we decided to speculate on that. So let's just leave it at that. This man has set a goal at the beginning of this year. He said, I will concentrate on K1 and I will go to the top. He's done it. Any man that sets a goal and is able to execute it through sweat, blood, and hard training deserves our standing ovation. And Alistair Overeem is no less than a champion, a deserving champion. That's his night. Yep. I had the pleasure to sit down with Alistair in Seoul to conduct the voice versus Alistair Overeem for HDNet. And what a gentleman he was. Very eloquent, very intelligent. Gave a lot of thought to the interview procedure. And it came out with great television. I'm so thrilled for him here tonight. I'm so thrilled for Peter Rose to have made it to the final and to have taken Simi Schultz out in the semi-final round. But what a moment here for Alistair. His daughter Storm is no doubt watching back in Holland. And he is elated. It will be written about, it will be talked about for a long time to come. And we will be able to say that we were there ringside and you at home were watching live when you saw Alistair Overeem become the first man in history to win the K1 Grand Prix title while also holding the world's MMA heavyweight strap. There is nowhere else I'd rather be than at the K1 World Grand Prix this time every year. King Mo Lawal, it's been an honor and a pleasure having you here ringside with us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Mike, once again, brother, as always, an absolute pleasure. We have had a fun time, folks, calling all the action for you. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for following all the K1 action in 2010. Wish you and your families a very safe and a Merry Christmas. A Happy New Year coming. Join us at Dynamite, the Saitama Super Arena, New Year's Eve. We'll probably see the ring there. Word is, he may fight for the dream heavyweight title. From myself, the voice, Michael Chavello. On behalf of the K1 World Grand Prix, we will be back for 2011 and more action. Until then, Merry Christmas, stay safe, and congratulations to the Reem. Thank you.